Good morning, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Silmarillion Film Project. I am your co-host, Dave Kale, uh, streaming to you live from Los Angeles with my son, Wallace, climbing on my leg. Uh, usual, usual early morning. <laughs> usual scenario, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. Just as we start the podcast, he decides whatever it is he's doing is boring, and he wants to come over and start harassing me. Good job, buddy. <laughs> I am joined, as always, by the Tolkien professor, Corey Olson, and uh, the Tolkien maven, Trish Lambert. We're glad that, that this is like two episodes in a row where you've uh, been able to come, Trish. After I that. know! Isn't that a big thing? I'm sure all my fans are thrilled. <laughs> they are. <laughs> hey, it's always sad without you, you know? It's it's oh. good to have a, to have a, the oh, whole gang so. together here. Hey, I learned yesterday that I have to be careful uh, about... Uh, telling people that they could be hobbits because I consider that a real compliment. But I have a friend of mine in, 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 in the company where I work who's very short. She's like 5'2". And she's really cute. She's, and she's a smile. And she was like, we were laughing with her yesterday. She's like, why are you laughing? And I said, you're just, your expressions, you know. I said, you could be a hobbit. And she looked at me and, and then I even put my foot in it even more. We just say, hey, a friend of mine has like these slippers that are like hobbits. <laughs> oh, you the hobbits. <laughs> and she said, she said, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I, yep. figured I, I left because I figured I better not do this. Oh, like, yeah. not everybody considers that a compliment. <laughs> just kind of slowly backed out of the room. <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah. wasn't any wasn't any repairing that one. You just no. leave it before you did more damage. Fortunately, I think she just considers me an eccentric old lady, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nice it, work. it is. Oh, what can I say? It my is. Fu- is done. It is funny sometimes. You know, I spend so much of my time, you know, immersed within our own peculiar community that occasionally right. I will have that kind of jarring experience when I'm talking with someone <laughs> who is just completely who doesn't even know Tolkien at all. You know, and I'll just make some <laughs> comment, and they look at me like I've got two heads, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's how normal people <laughs> act, isn't it? That's right. I, I gotta remember how to that. Communicate with norms. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's such a challenge sometimes. And for yeah. me, it's hard because, you know, playing the Lord of the Rings online, I mean, so many of my friends, you know, play hobby characters, and so do I. And so, you know, if, if we're actually, like, fellowing and doing stuff, and they're on a hobby character, it, we just naturally, like, well, oh, you're such a hobbit. Oh, God, look at the <laughs> hobbit. You know, it's just, it's, you know, it's just, like, natural for us to do that. I didn't even try to explain that. To <laughs> anyway. Uh, let that be a warning to the public. Like yeah. Corey just said, just, you know, be careful. If it comes up to, like, tell somebody they look like a hobbit or who knows what. Right. Just, Note to self. That is not taken as a universal compliment. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We, may have to start, we may have to start walking around in T-shirts that have a, a warning about you. <laughs> a warning. Right. I make many. I make many comparisons to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so so, so today so to today's episode today's episode yeah. we're going to talk about the battle under stars. Uh, we're going to talk about the Balrogs, and we're going to move forward uh, the overall strategy. I, you know, this has been this is of course uh, it, it's it's really interesting how this season goes. This season has a much like compared to the first two seasons. Season three has a much more sort of pro- prolonged um, the, like action stretch. You know, like we did a lot of build up and there was, you know, like in season one, we had the big sort of action moment of the destruction of the lamps, of course, in the middle. And we had a couple smaller incidents like the Ungoliant incident and stuff. Uh, But I mean, really, we had like the one isolated kind of crisis at the middle of the season. And then we had the battle at the end. And other than that, it was all sort of like character development and build up um, in other places. Similarly, last season, season two, we got a lot of intrigue. Right with uh, Melkor uh, and the Noldor in Valinor, um, but again, it wasn't until really the last couple episodes that things start to to kind of heat up and uh, and things start happening really fast. This season, um, it has a very different momentum. Right again, we do, we do, we we start off with a bang, right with the kin slaying in the first couple episodes, and then you know we 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 do a lot of sort of building and development and 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 setting things in motion, but we're looking at 
uh, you know, quite a few episodes in, you know, a stretch ending the season with a stretch of, you know, four or five pretty action packed episodes. Uh, and that's kind of neat. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. Um, <laughs> Mike Hockstead thinks that the Ungoliant incident sounds like a good, uh, episode title <laughs> i have to agree actually yeah. <laughs> that, that 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 does sound good i mean it kind of makes it sound like a you know some kind of like cold war spy code or something like that you know a, a, a code name code name on Goliant would actually be really intimidating but anyway um so uh anyway, so so I'm, I'm i'm excited to do the battle under stars thinking of you know i had a great time thinking about um you know the battle in the south, thinking about uh, the battle of Amon Arab uh, and uh, and and the Green Elves and the death of Denethor last time. We'll follow up some on that this uh, this uh, week, uh, but we're gonna get to Balrogs and see Gothmog in action, which is gonna be fun. Um, and uh, I just about an hour before the session started realized that we have some amazing awesomeness in uh, uh, impending. Just like right, that just a ripe fruit ready to be plucked, uh, a ripe fruit of awesomeness ready to be plucked in uh, uh, in this episode, um, which we'll talk about uh, 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 as we do the as we do the northern battle. Anyway, you lots of beyond the sort of obvious stuff. Yeah, something that I didn't realize before. Uh, before this is this is a, this is sort of a new thing. <laughs> I, I'm I'm making Marie nervous because she doesn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, you know Marie's always nervous when I go off the script, so uh, she you know she is foreseeing the difficulties they're going to have in trying to uh, 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 retcon my crazy suggestions into the story. Uh, Marielle assures me that it's not just Marie. Don't worry, don't worry, Marie. It's gonna be a, you'll love it. You'll love it. I promise you'll love it. Um, okay. So, but first announcements because we have a we have actually a long list of announcements because some really exciting things are happening around Mythgard and Signum right now and I want to make sure that you know about them because they're awesome. So, uh, first, we are starting our new Mythgard Academy class next week, The War of the Ring, volume 3 of the History of the Lord of the Rings series, uh, volume 8. Yes, 8. I always forget the volume numbers. Volume 8 of the History of Middle-earth as a whole. Um, so we're going to be looking at, you know, uh, the, the you know we're going to get Helm's Deep. We're going to get the Eowyn story. We're going to get the, the uh, Kirith Ungol and Shelob for the first time. We're going to get um, uh, the, 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 the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Seeing all of the, the sort of the, the, really the majority of the second half of the story uh, uh, coming into uh, focus in Tolkien's mind as we continue our examination of, uh, of Tolkien's process in developing The Lord of the Rings through his drafts. It's going to be great, great fun. I have so much enjoyed the Return of the Shadow and the Treason of Isengard classes that we've already done. Um, and that is just, it's been such a revelation to study those together. I am so grateful to the Mythgard Academy for uh, voting this in, this longitudinal uh, close study of the history of Middle Earth. Totally unprecedented. Not only have I never done it, I don't know anybody who has ever done a like, let's read through and discuss every volume of the history of Middle Earth cover to cover all the way through. It's kind of a crazy project, um, but it's been really, really neat. So, okay, so, so, but the War of the Ring, uh, that starts, so 10 p.m. Wednesday, Friday, so starts on Valentine's Day, what better way to celebrate Valentine's Day than start discussing the War of the Ring, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, uh, on, on Wednesdays, and it will now go. that could be another one of those be careful things, right, when you go, go to your Valentine and say, let's listen, let's <laughs> that's, to, that's, that's right, that's right, I, you know, yes, you can just, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> It's a date. It makes a really good date night, you know, War of the Ring discussion. Is that like, is that like Mythgard Academy and chill? Right? <laughs> exactly, right? Just get, you know, a bottle of champagne, a dozen roses, and the War of the Ring session, you know, from Mythgard Academy. Like, what bad? <laughs> how, how can you do it better? Um, but... Um, yeah, Mary Ellen's true. It's also it's also Ash Wednesday, so there is a kind of odd appropriateness oh to starting the War of the Ring yeah. on Ash Wednesday. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it it's so yeah. It just it just seemed like a good day, uh, uh, and also by starting it this coming Wednesday. Uh, according to my schedule, which of course everybody knows I adhere to uh, with strict zeal, um, uh, we're gonna we're, we're we're due to end the discussion of the book the day before 
Mythmoot begins. Um, so Mythmoot, uh, so like it'll, it'll go up until the middle of. We'll be discussing the War of the Ring until the until the middle of June, in other words, um, which is going to be pretty cool. So uh, you can see here the website mythgod.org slash academy slash War of the Ring. Um, uh, and uh, there you can get the, there's the registration link if you want to join our go-to webinar session. I'll also be broadcasting it on Twitch um, uh, and on Twitter as well, Twitter Live. So anyway, um, so that's the most immediate thing uh, that is coming up. Uh, the other really exciting thing that's been kind of brewing around Signum and Mythgard over the last uh, few weeks and months has been the growth of the regional moots. I've been talking about this. We've been wanting to do more and more regional gatherings. They have been so much fun, and I'm determined to uh, to, to start a, a, an international tour going around and, and meeting folks and doing awesome events because this is just too much fun uh, to keep to ourselves or to, or to hoard like a dragon in the mid-Atlantic region anymore as we've been doing for so many years. Uh, so, uh, so we're doing that. The, of course, the next one that is on the calendar is London Moot, which I have announced before. London Moot is uh, is really beginning to take off. We have uh, so um, Tex Moot is our most recent one that we just had in January, and it was fantastic. We had almost a hundred people come to Tex Moot. It was an absolutely wonderful event. Um, and London Moot has four times the number of people signed up for it that TexMoot did at the same, you know, relative time to the event. Uh, I'm not saying four time, 400 people are going to end up showing up at London Moot, but, uh, but it, it's on pace to, 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 to break old records already, and it's going to be, I, I'm so convinced it's going to be a great time. I've been wanting to do something with and for our uh, patient and long-suffering European listeners uh, for a long time, and I am very, very excited to get over there and get to meet folks. Um, so April 28th, 2018 in London. Go to londonmoot.com for all the details and the registration form. Um, I, uh, I hope that you will be, uh, um, that you'll be able to join us. Tim, so Timothy asks, will there be a field trip at London Moot? Oh, Tim. Yes, actually there will. Uh, 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 Darren Gray, who is the very uh, hardworking and generous soul who's been organizing London Moot with us, um, he is actually talking about organizing a literary tour of London the day before. So on Friday, he'll lead uh, a tour of uh, some of the really cool literary sites uh, in the London area, which is I think is awesome and which I'm totally planning to go to. Um, uh, you know, now, uh, Tim, I am definitely planning to go to Oxford and possibly Birmingham. Um when I am uh, when I am over there, uh, so I you know are we going to go that weekend? I don't probably not that weekend. I think I'm going to have to leave the day after, but I'm going to be there for uh, all, if not um, possibly all, or at least some of the week in advance. Um, we need to get you like a GoPro camera you could stick on your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, know, you could just do like you know a yeah. pilgrim's progress through. Oxford and Birmingham. That would be a good look, actually. You know, me at a Tolkien <laughs> conference with a little helmet and a GoPro strapped oh, on my forehead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it yeah. could be like a baseball cap. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> That'd be good. Um, no, it, it would be fun. I mean, I'm really looking forward to that. I, I am certainly so, uh, 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 Timothy. I'm definitely planning to go to Oxford, really and uh, I, I certainly, so I'm certainly going to do at least one. Uh, uh, Burden Baby field trip, which I'll announce so we, you know anybody who's in the area and could make it can come and join me at the Burden Baby. That would be uh, that would be fantastic. So uh, we'll see uh, we'll see we'll see what we can do. How many, how many people are registered, Corey? Uh, uh, how many people are, are registered? Yeah. I don't remember the number exactly. We're it's we're still two and a half months away from the event, and we already have I think. Where are we now? About 30 so far. We were hoping for like 50 or 60 total and we're already at 30, two and a half months out. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm now expecting something like at least 75 to 100 total people, uh, maybe yeah. more. So, yeah, it's going to be really great. Marielle, no, so far none of the register, uh, the registrants is named Christopher Tolkien. That seems quite unlikely, actually. Uh, very very unlikely um but uh but anyway it's uh it, 
it's the, the, the special guests there are going to be really, really cool. John Garth is coming. Oh my gosh, John Garth is so cool. Um, anyhow, so uh, so London Moot is going to be great if you can make it uh, uh, to England. Uh, uh, you know, for uh, uh, for the end of April, I strongly encourage you to come. Um, now, but the cool thing more regional moods. If you can't make it to England, don't worry, because we'll be coming somewhere near you, I hope, uh, soon, at least n- nearer to you, wherever you are, than we've uh, than we've been before. Um, in the last several weeks, we have confirmed several more regional events, um, which we'll be announcing specific dates and registration links and stuff for uh, 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 fairly soon. We are narrowing in on SoCal Moot in July 2018. Um, I was just talking with Dave. Dave is helping me scout for a venue and stuff we have some uh, uh we have uh, an interesting leader too there that we're still pursuing so we're not it's, that's not yet definite but it's we it's, it's uh, uh very very likely to happen we're we're we're, we're finalizing it july 2018 uh in the la san diego area um, that is, of course, as you as you may know, right around the time of Comic Con. So anybody who's traveling out to San Diego for Comic Con will be right there in the area and can pop in and join us. Um, then in August of 2018, we're going to be up in Oakland. So we're going to do the San Francisco Bay Area. We're probably going to call that Bay Moot. I'm thinking, but um, but anyway, yeah, that works. yeah so Bay Moot uh, will be uh, uh, will be in August, uh, probably middle of August. We're uh, looking at August 18th, I think, uh, for that. Um, so that's going to be awesome. Kansas City in October of 2018. This will be the second round uh, for our uh, for our middle moot, our Midwest moot, um, which is shifted south from Iowa to Kansas City this year. Uh, I'm just going to kind of rotate around a little bit, I think. Um, uh, so that's going to be cool. We're, gonna, we're going to Charlotte, North Carolina. That's now pretty much definite, either the 17th or the, or the 10th of November uh, uh, this year. Um, and those are just the ones that are that are already like pretty well on the calendar. We also are uh, working hard to finalize details and dates uh, for the Northeast. I'm looking for central New England, um, so it will be accessible from both New York and Boston. Uh, Denver. I've been talking with uh, uh, with uh, Tony Mead, who so often is able to join us here, uh, uh, who is excited to help facilitate a Denver moot, uh, and Toronto, uh, Maple Moot in Toronto. Uh, that one, m- the Toronto one, might not be able to happen until next year in 2019, but uh, but we'll see. We'll see what we can do. And I'm still interested to go to Seattle and Australia and New Zealand. We've had nobody step forward with, uh, uh, and, and I, I would add, you know, all of these moots are made possible by partnerships that we develop with local volunteers, especially. It's really hard for us to kind of come in from afar and just figure out how to do this. People with local knowledge and familiarity are a really crucial part. Um, we have a really great support system for uh, organizing the events. You know, nobody needs to do this from scratch. We have, uh, we've been making up what we call a moot in a box, you know, a set of instructions of like here's how to do things and here are templates for this and that and uh and you know to make sure to walk people through um the steps that need to happen in order to make it occur but uh but it's all the 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 on the strength of of our local friends and partners who are uh helping to help us to find venues and help us to uh to organize the events um so you know i'm i I have to admit i'm a little surprised that I haven't heard from anybody in Australia, all of the Australians and New Zealanders who have been, uh, uh, you know, engaged with us over the years. Nobody wants to help bring a uh, bring a moot down under. I'm, I, I'm shocked. Surely this should happen. Right. Australia or New Zealand, maybe December. Right. Middle of summer for you guys. This is when I, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this. Uh, we need to make this happen um, anyway. So it, this has just been uh, been super exciting, and I am really looking forward to my uh, uh, to my road tour uh, here this year, and all the opportunities to meet uh, and spend time with you awesome people. Um, however, in the middle of all of these fun regional events is the crown jewel of Signum events, which is Mythmoot Five on June twenty first to twenty fourth uh, down in Leesburg, Virginia. 
Uh, the regional events are really awesome, but of course, in large part, they are designed to like console people who can't make it to Mythmoot because Mythmoot is the real deal. The regional events are are are, are super fun. They're designed to be uh, low cost, high fun, one day events. Mythmoot is a four day event uh, and just kind of off the 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 charts. Last year's Mythmoot was by far the best the best event, most fun conference I have ever been to in my life. It was so wonderful the whole time. Uh, you know, the whole experience of being there. Um and uh Mythmoot 5 I just can't uh recommend it enough. Um it's of course more travel for many people. It's more of an investment. Um but you get a lot more with it too. Again, it's four full days. The 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 conference registration price includes meals for the whole time. Um there's discounted lodging which in the DC area is extremely useful to have discounted lodging uh, you can get discounted lodging right there in the venue uh and uh you know have uh, one of the you know on one of the side tunnels in the in the in the network of uh you know uh moria like uh, uh delvings uh of this venue where we meet in leesburg virginia um and it's 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 really really cool I, I, it was it was so fantastic last year and it's gonna be even better this year uh i i i definitely believe so um if you can work your way up to 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 myth mood, it is so worth it um, and then another event uh, which is coming up sooner and which is an online event, not an in-person event, uh, but something I've been looking forward to for months. February 17th, I'm going to do my fried chicken run. Uh, I am going to be uh, in, in, in Lotro. I will be assuming the form of a chicken and I will be running all the way across the digital Middle Earth from Mickle Delving to Mordor. Uh, and I will end up at the Cracks of Doom. Uh, it's not the route, but I'm hoping to take a side once you get into Mordor to go at least see the side of Bear. Yeah. It would be terrible to get all the way there and not Oh yeah, so. this will be the first time I've ever seen Mordor, and then the, you know, uh, Lotro released their Mordor expansion uh, just you know a, a little while back, and I, you know my character I don't have enough time to play. My characters are still too low level for Mordor, so I've never been there. Uh, so this chicken run will be the first time I will ever see. So if you want to join me to to see how they visually adapted Mordor and some of the uh, some of the things that we can see and the and and the stories that we can uh, uh, that we can begin both to both to perceive and to infer from what we can see in through there. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to see Mordor. So, um, uh, so Tim, that's going to be starting at 11 a.m. on fr- February the 17th. We're going to be broadcasting that on twitch.tv slash SignumU. So you don't have to be a game player to do. You, you could just tune in online to, uh, uh, to watch and to see. The visual adaptation of, uh, of Middle Earth in Lotro um, is really stunning. I think they've done a, such a wonderful job, and and it's not only sort of artistically appealing. Their consistent I- engagement with the story and their really thoughtful adaptation of Tolkien's text is something that has always impressed me from the very beginning, and I can't wait to see uh, the kinds of things that they're doing there uh, in uh, um, in Mordor. Uh, good. It's fun too. They they kind of do the same thing they. On, which was to ex- expand it and it long and you know like like in more like well what would it to be you know what would have been there um, right how would sauron you know been able to operate the way he operated and then they yes. actually build or using you know kind of answers and really i think it's just really interesting that so it'll be fun to go through there yeah, it is the kind of world building that they do um, is a really thoughtful kind of adaptation, quite like the adaptation that we do in film film. You know, given the the isolated things that the text does mention, uh, just as you say, Trish, what are the other things that have to have been in place around it? Right. What, what are the other things uh, that uh, that are kind of implied by the text just by the fact that we're, you know, we're told these bigger things happen. What kind of, what kind of structure is behind them? What kind of storylines are happening outside and behind the scenes connected with or, or paralleling even some of the events that we get in the stories? It's, it, I, I agree, Rohan is really interesting, the way that they flesh that out, because we see right. so little of Rohan comparatively in the stories, right? We just ride across country and we get to 
you know, we we get to 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 uh, to Edoras and we get to Helm's Deep and we get to Dunharrow, um, and we hear about the existence and other you know of other places and other areas and and peoples and and marshals, but we don't really get much of the story. Um, so yeah, watching them flesh that out is really interesting. Um, and I will be really, uh, really, really interested. So we, we'll, we'll wander around Mordor as, 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 as long as people successfully manage to keep the chickens alive. Keep you alive. Exactly, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, when, when we get to Mordor, I'm more afraid uh, that, because of course the, the high-level characters do a wonderful job of protecting us, I'm more afraid of... Um, you know, uh, stumbling into a lava pit or something and dying a, a, a comical, a, a comic, tra- a, a tragic comic, untimely death. Um, but um, anyway. By the way, uh, Phil Bob reminds me that for those of those of you that are listening to the probably who are ultra players and then running probably eaters chickens, their training day tomorrow. Uh, Sanson's farm. I can't remember what time it is. I want same time 11 o'clock so it's not you don't have to do to participate if you are do have a player who wants to ask but one tomorrow if you are interested in maybe doing it then you can find out what you need to do yeah yeah good um, right yeah phil confirms the training time is 11 a.m tomorrow so uh if you want to because if you and for those of you who don't play at all you're probably wondering like what on earth why are we talking oh, about chickens about. like <laughs> I I have to admit it's like it takes a lot of getting used to like it's it's just it's just kind of a thing it's one of those things where, like that has kind of grown over the years and become this bizarre subculture of the Lord of the Rings online but anyways I'm not I'm not going to try to explain it but in order to be able to run across the whole country in the form of a chicken which is an obvious goal which everyone should aspire to right but in order to <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I mean, it, go, it almost goes without saying, but um, if should you want to do that, you can't just do it for wanting, right? There's uh, training you have to go through, and uh, these these uh, these initial quests that you have to complete. So, um, 11 a.m. tomorrow, if you on uh, the Landreval server, if you show up at uh, uh, San- Sanderson, is that isn't that the name of his Sanson? Sanson, yeah. Sanson's farm. yeah. Sanson's- uh, yeah, in uh, just just north of the the main square there in Mickle Delving, um, you will meet some other folks uh, uh, who will be uh, who will be helping to to train you for the rigorous life of chicken running, and then you will be prepared to join us in the form of a chicken uh, Has next week. Anybody told me back when I first read this trilogy and fell in love with it that I would be talking years later about <laughs> yeah, joining up at a farm north of Mickle Delving to make a chicken run. I'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it uh, as um, as uh, Gaffer Gamgee says, it takes a lot of believing. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so that's enough of announcements. We had lots of announcements today. Let us finally so a, get to the as discussion. A great segue. I just want to say I got my notice that Twitch went live, and yeah. I got to say I love your title for today. So <laughs> let's kill Fanor. Let's kill Fanor. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, a little Doctor Who reference there. You know, for those I've been I've been I've been rewatching uh, Doctor Who. So yeah, let's kill Fanor. Uh, <laughs> all right. So Balrogs concerning Balrogs. Um, uh, this is, uh, of course, as usual, our slides are put together by the wonderful Marie Prosser, who is uh, desperately trying to keep me on track and moving along. So um, we do, of course, have three confirmed Balrog deaths that are described in the published texts. Um, Gothmog killed by Ecthelion in the Battle of Gondolin. Another is killed by Gorfindel right you know, at the end, oh, you know, as, the, as the refugees are, are fleeing from Gondolin. And then, of course, Gandalf kills Durin's Bane. Um, there are references to the deaths of Balrogs in the earlier sequence, but that's exactly sort of the problem, right? We have the the, the basic Balrog setup, or, or rather the basic Balrog conundrum, uh, is not whether or not Balrogs have wings, but how many of them there are. In Tolkien's early writings, especially in the Book of Lost Tales, there's clearly bunches and bunches of Balrogs. They're much more like foot soldiers. Um, and two or kills, what is it, seven, nine, twelve? He kills bunches of them. Um, by himself during the battle. Um, so um, uh, anyway, it, it's um, 
uh, the, the, the Tolkien's view of Balrogs, his his conception of the Balrogs ch- changes, and it changes in the direction of having them be fewer and individually much more of a big deal uh, as time went on. Um, so so the point is that all the Balrogs, all the other Balrogs will have to be killed by the end of the War of Wrath. So that is, we want there to be only one surviving Balrog. Um, we want Durin's Bane to be the last of his kind. Uh, I think now, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. We might be able to stash another Balrog or just like kind of release one in hiding somewhere. I actually think it'd be a little bit cool if, uh, you know, we knew that there is another Balrog, but like we just never hear from it again. So it's just like this myth, like somewhere out there, there is another Balrog and like, who knows if ever it may come back or, or, you know, just to kind of leave some mystery in the world. Right. You know, even the idea that like somewhere in, uh, um, Somewhere in in uh, in even in like the modern world, there is yet a Balrog uh, in hiding somewhere. is kind of cool. Um, and uh, Mario, I think we're going to resist any temptation that anyone really might have to introduce any kind of uh, uh, romantic relationship between a Balrog and anybody. That we're just not going there. Um, so okay, um, but 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 nevertheless, I certainly agree. Uh, we have to dispose of most of the Balrogs by the time we get to the end of the War of Wrath. Now, the War of Wrath provides us an opportunity to kill off as many Balrogs as we still need to kill off. Um, so we need to decide on how many how many Balrogs we want there to be, um, and then we need to think because if they're going to be if if they're going to be fewer, if we're going to go with later Tolkien thought on this and have them be individually much more of a big deal. And I think that's almost it's almost inescapable, right? I mean, because if we if we were to go with something like the early Balrog concept, then it totally undermines Gandalf's confrontation with Durin's Bane, right? Durin's Bane has to be a really huge deal, and we know that he's not even the captain of the Balrogs. So if Durin's Bane, who is sort of a garden variety Balrog, is a really, really big deal, as we want him to be, then all of the Balrogs have to be a really, really big deal, and so therefore there can't be too many of them. I have no idea. My camera just did something funny. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so I, I think it's it, it seems to me more or less inescapable uh, that we um, uh, that we need to make them a big deal, and so therefore uh, many fewer. Uh, so let's think about that. There were a couple suggestions um, from the discussion boards. It suggested parallel between Sauron's One Ring and the Three Elven, Seven Dwarfins, Nine Nazgul Rings, with Morgoth's Iron Crown, the Three Silmarils, Seven Balrogs, and Nine Dragons. Um, I think that that, that that overall structure or something in that direction was originally suggested by Fourth Dauntless. I think that's a really interesting idea. Uh, certainly the significance of the numbers. I mean, if you look at the quotation, uh, this quotation from the Annals of Amon in Morgoth's Ring is, I think, one of the last things he ever, Tolkien, one of the latest things Tolkien wrote about the numbers of Balrogs and things. And uh, Christopher Tolkien notes that uh, his father says there should not be supposed more than, say, three or at most seven ever existed. So you can see what a, what a massive change that is from the, the squads or, to use Carita's far better phrase, the bevies of Balrogs that we see in the early writings. Um, I have to say three seems to me totally unworkable, right? If those three Balrogs uh, that are that we list up there, right? If 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 Gothmog, Gorfindel's Balrog, and Durin's Bane are the only three Balrogs that ever existed, um, I, that, that, to me that's kind of that's kind of hard. Uh, I'd, 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 seven, I'm much more willing to go with seven. I think that seven seems like a fine number. Um, now, Hakan suggests that there could be Balrogs of different sizes and terribleness, and I agree. I mean, we can have variations. We already have Gothmog sort of distinguishing himself among the Balrogs, right, as their captain and one of uh, Morgoth's primary primary advisors. But I, you know, I think that we, we'd have to have some kind of rationale there or something. I mean, like, I don't want to get into, like, Balrog subspecies or whatever. You know, it's just... I think it's better to keep them... It's, um, especially since there's going to be a small number of them. Um, I kind of like uh, seven... Well, okay, so... I didn't even remember, Marie, that we had 20 of the 
of the the Maiar, the because remember in season one, for those of you who didn't listen to season one, which I think most of you did, but for those of you who didn't listen in season one, we decided that the spirits of fire, um, who would eventually become the Balrogs, uh, these these are spirits of fire who would be some of Melkor's primary followers, um, and before the destruction of the lamps, when Sauron, uh, excuse me, Morgoth really revealed, or Melkor at the time, really reveals himself, uh, the Balrogs were going to be gorgeous. We're going to be these beautiful, like, you know, angelic looking creatures with fiery wings and, and beautiful, and then their wings are going to, are going to get like, are, you know, are going to get destroyed uh, during the, that's like the, the joke uh, that we, anyway, so um, they will be formerly wingless, but they won't have wings anymore, which means that everybody who talks about Balrogs having wings are just being insensitive, not only inaccurate to the text, but personally insensitive to the feelings of the Balrogs uh, who no longer have their wings. Um, but anyway, so the they they are the ones who uh, in our in our adaptation who uh, perpetrated you know who actually enacted the destruction of the lamps and in the the flaming you know holocaust that uh, that was the you know the unleashing of the fire of the lamps um, they are you know they are marred and that's when they become the sort of the shadow and flame and um, and. Uh, um, you know, the, the sort of hideous creatures that they will eventually become. Um, so we, um, so, okay, so Marie, you're saying during the script discussions you had numbered, you had numbered 20? Um, okay, and then Arian defected. That was one of the really cool things that we had decided. Arian, who's going to be the spirit who's going to drive the sun, remember, which is going to come up soon. We're going to do the sun next time. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to come back to Arian, and so we need to be remembering that for next time. But anyhow, um, so Aryan uh, defected from among them, leaving 19, and then we had 10 killed in the fall of Utumno, currently leaving 9. Well, you know, we can always off more of them if we want, Marie. I think we can... Uh, um, I mean, those numbers seem relatively arbitrary. I mean, like the 20 seems kind of arbitrary. Why not 18, right, if we wanted it to be 18? Um, so, Trish and Dave, what do you guys think? 7 or 9 Balrogs? I think I'm of the opinion that more Balrogs are better. So more is better. Nine. I was thinking the same thing. Nine. Yeah. yeah. Unless there's a unless there's a, some kind of numerical symbology thing we want to do there. Now, our, I, I, the Balrogs that we have from the I mean, these are the Balrogs we've had since the beginning, right? Yes. In other words, these are the guys who used to be gorgeous. And, yep. And yep. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. So I'm 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 for the higher number. Okay. Uh, they don't make any baby Balrogs, right? So what we have is what we exactly. have. Exactly. Yes. These are these are they're embodied spirits, just like uh, just like all the rest of the the Maiar. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So we know we need to have at least one still left alive to meet up with uh, Gandalf later on down the line. Right. I mean that's another reason why I think a higher number is good. Yeah, because if we have if we have nine. Again, we're going to lose Gothmog and at least one more at Gondolin, right? right? We need right. to save at least one. I, 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 I kind of, especially if we're going to have nine, I think we'll have a spare, right? So let's have two survive. Because I, 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 right. I kind of like the mystery Balrog thing. Like that was, I yeah. kind of, I, I said that fairly spontaneously, but the more I've thought about it ever since I've said it, the more I really kind of like it. Um, so let's save two. So that means we have to account for seven. Seven Balrog, we need seven Balrog deaths before the end of the first stage, right? And again, two will be accounted for in Gondolin. So that leaves us with five disposable gon uh, Balrogs. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> which, you know, we just, so we can, now we can kill off, a, we can kill off up to five, of course, in the War of Wrath itself. I mean, you know, that the, 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 the and I think we should, I'm thinking at least three uh, need to be, need to be killed in the War say, of Wrath. I have recycling on my mind this morning, so I just have it's like, okay, keep your Balrogs separate from your other recyclables. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, okay, so let's get, um, so let's say, let's, let's pencil in three Balrog deaths for the War of Wrath, right? So we'll have five Balrogs remaining at the beginning of the War of Wrath, three of them are killed in like the final defense of Utumno, uh, and then the other two scatter, right? The other two flee. Um, 
Uh, and so that's where we get, that's where Dorian's Bane comes from. Um, so that means two, right? Am I, am I counting right. correctly? Uh, yes. Yes, that's right. Okay, so that means that we can kill up to two Balrogs outside of Gondolin. We can either kill another one at Gondolin. That seems like overkill to me. Or, you know, and boy, Balrog overkill. How much, how, you know, how often do you use that phrase? Like, we've killed too many Balrogs today. Um, so that gives us two opportunities to kill Balrogs in other places. Where would we want to kill Balrogs? Now, Nick, I agree we could just have five killed in the War of Wrath, but I'm thinking, and, and we might. Maybe maybe we don't find, I mean, I don't want to force it. You know, I don't want to just, like, determine, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we're going to kill Balrogs in other places just because. But it could be, especially since the Balrogs are such a big deal, there may be moments where we choose that we want to we want to send somebody out with a particular blaze of glory and we can have them take, a, take out a Balrog. Um, uh, Chris, the Dagor Bragalock does suggest itself. Ooh, Mariel is thinking about Arendel's adventures. That's interesting. Now, of course, he's roving fairly far afield, so I wouldn't think he'd probably encounter Balrogs. Um, but that kind of thing, that kind of thing is just... What if he, what if he runs into a mystery Bal Balrog? What if we have what if we have two Balrogs kind of escape into the into the far reaches and then Arendel kills one of them? Right, right. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I don't want to rule out the Arendel thing because we are going to need some good adventures for Arendel. Because remember, when we get to the Arendel portion of the story, we're going to be breaking new ground. We're going to be writing the story Tolkien never wrote. All, you know, so often talked about and never actually wrote. Um, I. Now, Mariel does point out, though, that that would break the, the whole only kill Balrogs by dying thing, and I, I would actually kind of like to keep that. Um, at le maybe not in the War of Wrath, but everywhere else, I think it would be pretty great if uh, if we do uh, kill off a... Can we give Arendel a, uh, uh, a brave comrade who goes out in a blaze of glory? Yeah, we could. We could. Could. Always possible. Um, we... Another thing that occurs to me, what about Ignor? Remember, Ignor is going to be a, a, one of our romantic leads in season four, right? I mean, he's he is the beloved of uh, of of Andreth, and we were going to make a we we're going to make a big deal of that relationship. And he's scheduled to die in the Dagor Bragalak, the Battle of Sudden Flame, in which qua Battle of Sudden Flame, the Balrog seems you know, Balrog seem to be like heavily involved in that, right? Um, Ignor is another example. So Nick, this is what I'm thinking. This is why I was thinking of of, of maybe shifting some bow, a couple of one you know a couple one or two Balrog deaths earlier on, because there are times like that, like Ignor, who were just told like an Ignor is killed in the battle. We have no idea under what conditions Ignor dies, but especially since we were wanting to make Ignor a little bit more of a heroic character, um, giving him uh, uh, giving him an opportunity to. Uh, die heroically like that, you know. Um, as for how you kill him, Marie, well, we've got some time to think about that. Let's kick that can down the road. Um, I, I, but I definitely, the Dagor Bragalak seems like a really sensible moment uh, to kill a Balrog. Maybe we save another one for... Uh, uh, for Arendel, possibly. I, you know, I want to. I, we we can keep that option open. Um, there may be. The more, the more I think about this, Corey, the more I really like this idea of like just kind of scattering the Balrogs throughout the story, mm -hmm. and and making it to where making it to where by the second or third time when the Balrog shows up, the audience knows what this means. Right. Right. Like means somebody on the screen is going to die. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, and because oh. because either the Balrog is just going to kill them, which also happens, right? I mean, you know, Gothmog shows up and, and you know, so uh, the Balrog show up and, and, and Feanor dies. You know, the, the Balrog show up and Fingon dies. You know, Fingon is going to get killed by Gothmog at, at uh, the, the near Nyth Ar Arnoidiad. So, um, yeah, exactly. There's going to be uh, the, the, the Balrogs coming in and 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 Dave, think of the, think of the payoff with that, right? Think of the payoff for Gandalf, right? When Gandalf realizes that it's a Balrog coming in, and and think how much more powerful 
remember how Jack, I mean, Jackson did a great job with this, right? That look that Gandalf gets when, cause like he knows and nobody else really understands what this is and what this means. Right. But just think of, think of the way that the, the, the kind of reaction that the, that the viewers will have, right. And how they can be on the, like Gandalf will realize what all of the viewers are already thinking, right. Oh man. Like there's only one way this is going to go down. Right. And the only question is, are you going to be able to take it out with you? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. That that you're right. Jackson does a great job with that scene, but it really it would add just a little some additional gravitas if instead of it sort of being like, oh, it's a scary monster, and look, Gandalf's concerned. If right. He's, if you kind of know what he's thinking in that moment, which is yes, which is so yeah, there's only one way out of this. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I. I. That idea of Balrogs being associated with just with death when they come onto this onto the, onto the stage, somebody's going to die. Um, I think that's really really good. Now, what this means is we have to be careful. I we've been thinking, at least I've been thinking, somewhat casually and slightly sloppily about the Balrogs as just being a kind of a shock squad. You know, like Gothmog and his uh, group of Balrog thugs leading an army of orcs. If we want the Balrogs really to have the effect that they have, you know, like that Durin's Bane has, I think we rarely want more than one of them in one place, right? I mean, if there's more than one Balrog in one place, that should mean, like, I mean, that should be, like, you know, absolute catastrophe, right? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, one Balrog is almost insurmountable, Um multiple Balrogs is a practically unstoppable force. Um, but that doesn't, but that could also, that could also me, that could also be an indicator of the, um, the prowess or the importance of the, the protagonists who are on screen in such a circumstance, right? Like, absolutely. Like, like if we have, if we have Feanor get assaulted by uh, a gaggle of Balrogs, um, that just goes to show you just how powerful the the, the Noldor around Fanor were at that time. <clears throat> right. Or if if there's a couple Balrogs in the assault on Gondolin, same deal. But I, I think I agree with you in general that we shouldn't be cavalier about throwing gangs of Balrogs at people. Yeah, exactly. Now, and I do want to clarify, when I'm talking about like a Balrog coming in and being, you know, almost unstoppable, I don't mean in the... Sauron in the Battle of the Last Alliance and Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring film kind of action, right? I'm not thinking of a Balrog swooping in and, and like hurling, you know, a, a, a dozen elves a hundred yards away with each stroke, right? That's not how Balrogs should be. Remember, Balrogs aren't even that big, actually. I mean, they're bigger than people, but they're not that much bigger. Um, I mean, I'm thinking if our elves... <laughs> A Balrog should not be more than, what, like, nine feet tall? Something like that, right? Big, uh, but not, you know, Balrogs are nine feet tall. They're not 20 feet tall or 30 feet tall, right? Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, right, exactly, Chris, about about 1.5 times the size of, of an older. That's, that's exactly it. Um, uh, and Brian, you're absolutely right. Brian Demick is reminding us that it's one of the ways that we can convey the, 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 the shock and awe of the Dagor Bragolach, right? Is to have like this, like, you know, like five Balrogs running in front of the, you know, running with the flames in the front of the battle. Uh, you know, that's just going to be, that's just going to be, uh, you know, incredible. Um, so... But what this means strategically, though, is that, for me anyway, this means an adjustment to how how Morgoth uses the Balrogs, right? Um, that, again, we, we're not going to have Gothmog as captain in the sense of personally leading a squad of Balrogs on almost any occasion, right? He, Morgoth is going to be deploying them for other uses. Now, some of them are going to be deployed for the uses of, like, 
managing slave labor and stuff like that. I mean, like there can be a Balrog in charge of the, uh, you know, in charge of the dungeons of, of Utumno, right? There can be, um, or not Utumno, um, of course, Angband. There can be, uh, oh, there might have been an Utumno as well, but, you know, there can be another, you know, so, and, and uh, Dave, this is where I'm thinking towards, you know, you kind of planted the seeds of this with your Arendel comment, right? He can be sending some far afield. Um, you know, might he even send Balrogs off into the east of Middle Earth, you know, to, uh, like, on purpose, right? Um, uh, David suggests he might keep them as his personal guard. Yeah. I think he would probably keep a couple, two or three Balrogs with him um, at all times um, as uh, as his personal guard. I think that that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, well, so we're, I'm not saying that we have to personally deploy all nine Balrogs. Um, but we might need to be we, we, we might need to be thinking of explanations. Now, Balrogs are not cunning, right? They're not uh, they are not what Sauron is. They don't fill Sauron's role. Um, so he is not necessarily Morgoth isn't necessarily going to be deploying them. Um, and we've depicted them as m- more like thugs. So he will send them to keep people in line. He will send them to strong arm people. Um, uh, he will send them out for like the undertaking of great, um, uh, great labors of different kinds, but he's not going to send them out on reconnaissance. He's not going to send them out. He's not going to delegate strategic, you know, uh, 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 missions to them in the sense of they're coming up with strategy or, or, or really sort of so executing like the, strategy. these are like the Hulk smash. Hulk smash. Category. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, Cause we did that before, right? They're the ones we said that Melkor sent yeah. out to destroy the lamps. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think the idea here, the idea here, it, um, it, it, it's less sort of thinking about what to do with them militarily. And it's more a question of like, how do we maintain that 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 feel on screen of when the Balrog shows up, the viewer and the characters feel terror, right? Right. Like if we're going to be using them a lot, if we just turn them into kind of like slightly more powerful um, soldiers who are in a lot of scenes and we see them fighting and, you know, and we see them occasionally losing and stuff. And by the time Gandalf confronts um, the Balrog on Doran's bridge, is that, you know what I mean? It's going to be like, oh, one of those guys again. Oh, the, our, the protagonists are beating them all the time. How many times have we seen <laughs> you know, elves whip up on the Balrogs? Yeah, no big deal. Like, we want, we, want it, we want it to be where if, whenever a Balrog shows up on screen, the viewers, the viewers shudder and feel a sense of terror. Yeah. So, well, that's... so I think we just want to be choosy about how we, choosy. How and when we have them show up. Exactly. Choosy is exactly it. We need to use them much more sparsely. Um, but this is why the hard thing I'm, ha- the thing I'm having a hard time with is from Morgoth's point of view, why should he use them sparsely? I mean, it's like, how can we possibly explain why Morgoth, who has these like almost unstoppable forces and he's just like, I'm going to choose voluntarily to deploy them very infrequently just because. And singly, right? Right. I mean, and individually. Oh, whatever I do, I'm not going to bring these weapons together in one place and have them, ba- um... Yeah, I mean that cuz Dave I agree with you that that sense of impu- of impending death like a Balrog has come, you know, one or more of us is definitely going to die. The only question is will we be able to, you know, might we possibly be able to take uh it with us. Um uh All right, well, here's a here's a here's a here's an off the wall idea that might not work. But I'm just going to throw it out there. What if we what if we treat the Balrogs less like shock troops and more like missiles in the sense that um when they show up they cause a lot of destruction and and whoever is if someone's personally confronting them they die they inevitably die uh but what if just it seems like every time morgoth sends one out it dies too (laughs) 
and they, then he might he might be a little more careful about using them. Um, and Balrogs so are a non-renewable so, resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, okay, actually, okay. So there are two two suggestions. Um, uh, David Atley and uh, Hakan have just made two really good suggestions. Basically, so David is suggesting that the key should be Morgoth's paranoia, right? Um, he so first he's going to keep a bunch of the Balrogs with him. I suggested three, maybe more than three, right? Maybe he keeps five of them in Angband at all times, no matter what, right? Um, uh, so yeah, the fact that he's paranoid could 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 be a big part of it. Um, oh yeah, there, that that would work if 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 he just he doesn't send them out because he because he's uh, freaked out and he's always wants to keep most of them around him to protect him. Like, right. I think. He, I, I I actually don't think I don't I'm not that concerned about sort of having to explain why there aren't why why doesn't he just send the Balrogs to every single battle and just bulldoze everyone like like I I think I think we can come up with an explanation like this one like his paranoia that that viewers won't question. Well, I I think that I think that at least especially for now I think that Hakan has it. Hakan's specific suggestion is Morgoth is still afraid the Valar are going to come after him, right? I mean, he's still afraid of pursuit. He thinks that this is just a, like the, the elves coming and like the Noldor coming in. They're not the threat, right? He is reserving his main forces in defense of Angband because he still expects Orome and Tolkis any moment, right, to come in and try to haul him back in front of Manway. And it is, and that's why he keeps the Balrogs with him because he's afraid if he sends the Balrogs out to, you know, if he sends all the Balrogs out to fight the Noldor, he's left exposed and, uh, you know, the Valar are going to come for him and uh, and then he's going to be hosed. So he keeps them with him at all times, most of them with him at all times, and only deploys a few. So how many Balrogs we need the uh, the death of Feanor, of course, is one of our main multiple Balrog moments, right? We're going to have... So places where more than one Balrog will be on the field at one time will include the death of Feanor. We definitely want more than one... We're going to need more than one of them at the Dagor Bragalach, more than one of them at the Near Nith Arnoidiad. It's, it, it's the second Balrog who comes up behind Fingon that enables Fingon to be killed by Gothbog. So we need, uh, we need multiple Balrogs there. Uh, we need... Um, what else do we need? Um, are there other moments? Oh, Gondolin, of course, the fall of Gondolin. Um, so, yeah, but that's, so that's like four times. I think in every other occasion, um, they, uh, um, he, he, he's going to keep all of them with him and he's going to only send out, you know, maybe one. So Gothmog has an army of orcs and he's watching the coast. Um, there should be another, one other Balrog, right? Of course, Nick. Yes, in the War of Wrath, obviously. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Lincoln is suggesting that Morgoth sends multiple Balrogs after F- Feanor out of spite. Yeah, I think in, like for the prize of 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 getting Feanor, he's willing to risk sending out. An- if he sends out two more, if Gothmog is out there, and then he sends out two more Balrogs to reinforce them, so that three Balrogs end up converging on Feanor. Um, that would seem to do because then he'd still be keeping six Balrogs with him as uh, as Valar insurance essentially. So bad, I'm bad. Absolutely. So I was just thinking this could be a Sesame Street game. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The Balrogs in this Sorry. episode brought to you by the number three. Um, what Balrogs? <laughs> what ba- oh, oh, what? two Balrogs. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And Nick, I agree with you. They're looking to capture him, which is why he isn't immediately killed by the multiple Balrogs. Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, Morgoth that, absolutely that maybe, wants Feanor alive. And maybe that partially explains why he sends multiple Balrogs. He wants an yes. overwhelming force to ensure that he can capture Feanor instead of kill him. Yes. Also, also this dovetails with the Morgoth paranoia um, angle right because don't we we're 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 wanting him to origin to initially construe the arrival of the Teleri ships as the coming of the Valar the host of the West yes West. the vanguard of the coming of the West yeah 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 okay absolutely um 
Yep. Yeah. No, I think that that I think I think that this works out really well. So um, I'm liking this new conception of the Balrogs. So even like normally the Balrogs will not themselves. Like, many of the battles aren't even going to include any Balrogs at all in combat. Um, we do need to save that. I think that even the Balrogs themselves, just because the Balrogs are thugs and really powerful doesn't mean that they're particularly like selfless or courageous, right? Um, they could generally prefer to lead from the back and just use their flaming whip whips to drive the orcs into battle in front of them, and they only intervene when it looks like there's really a need, right? So when, like Fingen, right? Fingen, you know, the, 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 the battle of, from Morgoth's perspective, the near Nith Arnoidiad is going really well, except here's Fingen, right? And Fingen and Turgon are putting up this this resistance, this defense, you know, with the unexpected arrival of the Gondolindrum, it kind of looks like they might escape, at least escape, if not actually win, right? So at that point, Gothmog is like, all right, let's do this. I'm taking a hand myself. And, and he goes and fights Fingen. Um, whereas again, before that, they're not, they're not going to be leading the battle usually, right? That's not going to be their normal role. Um, uh, so, um, Anyway, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I, uh, I think that that, that's uh, I'm, 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 I'm liking this refinement of the, of the, of the role of the Balrogs. You know who's really gonna like this too, right? Who? The budget, the budget people. The budget people, right? Yes. <laughs> Fewer CGI Balrogs on screen is better. Yes, <laughs> yes. I agree. Um, yeah. Oh, Lincoln, I'm not necessarily saying that the flaming whips have to be their, their only or primary weapons. I'm just saying that I mean, it's one that we know that they use. Um, and I, I, I was thinking of the whips primarily as an illustration of the fact that it's not even, a, it's, it's a tool. It's not a weapon, right? Because their primary job, you know, sort of, I was just thinking of playing off the the whole flaming whip thing as a way to to, to emphasize the fact that their primary job in battle is uh, is slave driving the orcs into combat through fear, as we saw the orcs themselves are afraid of Doran's bane in Moria, right? Um, and um, uh, and uh, and and not like necessarily, you know, but the. Doran's Bane had a sword, right? And I would think that the, you know they would they would get out weapons of that kind, um, you know, either either uh, swords or or you know brutal clubs or or whatever like Grand, you know that that Melkor uses um, when they actually are fighting. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. How you're describing doing the Balrogs now pretty much consistent with the behavior of the in Moria. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, I think it does. It does. That does make more sense to me. Um, now, by the way, we've kind of glanced over this and, and obviously now is not the time to think this through very thoroughly. The choice to say that there are only going to be seven dragons is actually a bigger deal than saying they're going to be nine Balrogs. Um, if we're suggesting there are seven dragons, a bunch of people have mentioned, uh, both here in the comments and in the discussion board, that that's a really appealing idea, that the seven dwar the seven dwarven rings, right, and the seven dragons, like the, the, the kind of parallel between uh, between dwarves and, and dragons is kind, of, is, is kind of cool, kind of works. And I agree, I really like that. But I just wanted to point out that, like, seven dragons is super restrictive, and it's act that's actually a pretty big... Um, deviation from from the published text in which there's like a whole brood which i think is means like more than six and especially when we get the winged dragons uh afterwards and like smaug and everything i mean i th that dragons breed right unlike balrogs dragons breed uh so if we're gonna have there be seven if we're gonna restrict the total number of dragons to seven uh we need to we need to think that through um but um, but anyway, we'll we don't have to we don't have to make a firm decision on that now. We'll 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 stick with nine Balrogs, and we can defer the dragon discussion because we're not at dragons yet. So yeah, and I mean the seven rooms really had to dwarf right, so it's not really wait. So could could you say that again? Your kind of your audio is kind of breaking up a little bit, so I, I sort of miss oh, I missed that one. Didn't um, I mean the seven are really the 
seven dwarf tribes. It's not really connected to tribes per se. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, no, that that would really just be just be a parallel. But um, no, I agree. So yeah, you yeah. know, people are. Uh, 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 s- several people are suggesting that basically we have the seven the seven fathers of the dragons. So uh, yeah, grandsire. Yeah, yeah. So like you know, well, well, anyway. Glaurung has six or seven you know offspring right. and uh, so Glaurung whatever. ruin of dragons. So to speak. Exactly, exactly. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, we'll 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 as I say, now is not the time for the dragon discussion. But uh, you know, worth. Uh, we're thinking about. Okay. All right. Let's, um, having established that, let us, let us now broaden this a little bit to be thinking about the villains in general. So, okay. So at first Morgoth thinks the ships signal the Valar's response. Then he learns it's Feanor. So how's he going to learn this? Uh, I'm thinking that Gothmog needs to send a runner, right? So he's going to send an orc scampering off, um, to, uh, so, cause he, Gothmog, and his orcs are going to see the burning of the ships and they're going to come and investigate and they're going to see the ships burned and they'll probably be a little bit confused about that because like what the heck is going on and um, they will um, they're going to discover that it's Feanor so they have to send a messenger back uh, to tell Morgoth that it's Feanor that would enable him then Morgoth to send out a couple more Balrogs with another force of orcs so that the two forces of orcs can kind of converge on them. Um, uh, okay, so now we said that there had been discussion about Sauron's werewolf army being recalled uh, to Angband. Certainly having um, sacked the Phalas as much as they can, they're not, they, we weren't going to use them for uh, Doriath anyway, so the, the werewolf army is kind of done. Um, so we're, we're going to recall them to Angban. This, of course, is one of the changes that we've made. Um, uh, that army, of course, uh, it, which is recalled back up and then defeated by Keligorm in the book, as we'll, we'll, we'll read the passage in a minute, is, of course, an army of orcs in the book. Um, we had uh, made it the werewolf army under, uh, uh, under uh, 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 Drogluin, which I think is cool. Um, and this, this, is, this, this, this leads... Marie, to my awesome uh, uh, realization that I had earlier today. But anyway, yeah, so, so the werewolf army is going to going to be recalled upwards. Uh, Sauron's role, I think he needs to still be in contact with his captains. Um, so he is going to talk to Drogluin and send Drogluin and the werewolves up to, uh, so, so that the idea is, because he can't, like, he, he, Goth, uh, not Gothmog, um, Bulldog, and the orc army, they're way the heck on the other side of Beleriand. Like, they can't possibly get... There are not enough bunny sleds to get them across Beleriand in time uh, to fight with Feanor at the, you know, at the Battle Under Stars. So, uh, but the werewolves can do it. They're much more mobile, and they're closer anyway, because, I mean, they could have come back north anyhow and be kind of massing near Doriath. So Sauron just, like, has a meeting with Draugluin. Um This means that we need a messenger sent for... Who does Melkor use as messengers? We know that you know Sauron would probably send Thorin Gwethil on a on a message mission like that, um, but um, um, uh, well, Morgoth talking. Morgoth would just send the Balrogs because they have wings. <laughs> right, <laughs> of course. What am I thinking? The aerial messengers. Um, oh, that was the first thing I thought of. It's just bats would have be the flying. Yeah. Ones, yeah. Yeah, no. I, I guess he could just use another another vampire bat, one of Thorin. It's not like it's not like, you know, uh, Sauron has like an absolute monopoly over all of the you know the wolves and vampire bats and stuff. There would still be, there would still be some. He could send, um, um, he could send a uh, uh, as Chris Stevens was suggesting, just some kind of minor spirit. Actually, we'll come back to that. Minor like spirits of shadow that he has are gonna are that that's gonna become relevant again later in this episode actually, um, but anyway so he, uh, by some mechanism Melkor sends instructions to Sauron to say, Thanor and the Noldor have landed in the north come send help and so Sauron says great Dragluin, uh, you're not busy. Go take the werewolves up and attack them from the south so that the idea is Gothmog comes in either behind or circles down from the north. The werewolves come up from the south and uh, the uh, new uh, army under the two other Balrogs 
that he's sending out to capture Feanor uh, come. So the idea is to, you know, converge on the Noldor and, and on Feanor and stomp him out and take him uh, personally captive, kill all the rest and take Feanor prisoner. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that sounds, that sounds great. Now, Sauron isn't himself going to go or anything. He's still orchestrating stuff in the South. You know, Baldog just had a defeat, but he's about ready, uh, to, uh, uh, to come in and spring his Doriath plan, um, while Thing, while, uh, 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 Thingol is out in the field. So that's pretty cool. So he's, he's occupied. Um, all right, uh, uh, the werewolves are unable to reinforce the orcs, right? Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so the orcs are routed. Which ones? Um, okay, okay, so uh, let's... Um, hang on a second. Let's... let's I, I, I want to jump around a little bit here. Okay. Um, first, let's read the text so that we, we just refamiliarize ourselves uh, with this here. This is the description of the Battle Under Stars. The host of Feanor went up the long firth of Dringus that pierced the echoing hills of Arid Loman, and passed thus from the shores into the great land of Hithlum, and they came at length to the long lake of Mithrim, and upon its northern shore made their encampment in the region that bore the same name. But the host of Morgoth, aroused by the tumult of Lamoth and the light of the burning at Lothgar, came through the, pass of er- the passes of Arid Wethrin, the mountains of shadow, and assailed Feanor on a sudden, before his camp was full wrought or put in defense. The Noldor, outnumbered and taken at unawares, were yet swiftly victorious, for the light of Amon was not yet dimmed in their eyes, and they were strong and swift and deadly in anger, and their swords were long and terrible. The orcs fled before them, and they were driven forth from Mithrim with great slaughter, and hunted over the mountains of shadow into the great plain of Ardgalan that lay northward of Dorthonian. There the armies of Morgoth that had passed south into the Vale of Syrian and beleaguered Círdan in the havens of the Falas came up to their aid, and were caught in their ruin. For Celegorm, Feanor's son, having news of them, waylaid them with a part of the elven host, and coming down upon them out of the hills near Ithil Syrian, drove them into the fen of Serech. Evil indeed were the tidings that came at last to Angband, and Morgoth was dismayed. Ten days that battle lasted, and from it returned of all the hosts that he had prepared for the conquest of Beleriand no more than a handful of leaves. Okay. Um, so. By so. the way, Tolkien is really bad at the um, uh, run-on sentences and the like, <laughs> scattered punctuation. Uh it's yes um it's that epic it's that epic yes it's that it's that he get right when he's describing things like that he gets all he gets all paratactic you know he gets all like i am stringing clauses together it's not really about normal kind of sentence structure uh the number of conjunctions that we get the ands right um and they were strong and swift and deadly in anger and their swords were long and terrible the orcs fled before them, and they were driven forth and hunted over the mountains of shadow. That 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 kind of structure, that kind of stringing things together with ands, uh, is something that he does a lot when he's describing battles. Um, so yeah, I do think that that's uh, that that's an intentional stylistic choice on his uh, on his part. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so okay, so several things here. First of all, um, notice that where's the. Uh, what, what, what's come of our map? Okay, here's our map. Uh, or I say this is our map. Uh, this is the map from Karen Fonstad's Atlas of Middle-Earth with some additions uh, from us uh, to remind us of the stuff that we have put into here. So we have Gothmog, who was lurking around up here. Remember, we have him up not just out to the west, but to the northwest, because Gothmog's whole point, he is the advance guard against any incursion from Valinor. Right. So he's up there with an orc army waiting and ready. Like, uh, you know, if Orme is going to cross the hell Karaxa, Gothmog is like, bring it. I'm here. Uh, he's he's the he's the the, the vanguard uh, in that defense. Kierden is, remember, on this island. Right. He sailed up here and they saw the they saw the burning from a distance, the burn, the ships. The, so the 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 charred remnants of the ships. And Amros are here, right? Uh, and then Sauron's. So th- this is the orcs in the text that are coming up from the south, and then beaten back by Kelegorm. Um, uh, but it's going to be the werewolves, of course, in our uh, in our version. 
now the orcs that come in and attack are crossing the passes of Arid Wethrin, so they're, they're crossing here like this. Again, this is, this is you know, Karen Fonstead's map here is accurate. The th- main thing that we're at, there, there, so the two main changes that we have already made, right? One is the separate force under Gothmog, which is attacking from an entirely different direction. The second is the fact that the southern uh, army is werewolves and not orcs. Now, here's, so here's my quick question. Um, which group of orcs attacks them first? So we have the orcs attacking their camp at by Mithrim before they have fully put it in defense. Um, I'm thinking that's got to be Gothmog, right? So Gothmog comes in with the initial attack and then is reinforced by the orcs coming from Angband. Is that does that that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that's probably the way it has to happen, right? Um, why, why do you think that's the way it has to happen? Because I think that Gothmog is, he's already like on the scene and he saw the burning of the ships, right? So he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's right there. So if somebody is going to like sneak attack them well, first, he, it's probably couldn't Gothmog. He maybe, couldn't he maybe be like, well, I'll wait for reinforcements. He could. Hey, Gothmog doesn't seem very much like a let's wait for reinforcements kind of guy. Like he could be a lead from the rear kind of guy, but I don't think he's going to be timid. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I think especially once he sends a message back to Angband, and so he's like, "All right, you know, uh, we're probably going to get reinforcements, but let's let's just, you know, th- now is the opportunity. Right. While you know, after they've just and arrived, and and once he's sent a once he's sent a message back to Angband, then it's kind of bad optics if he <laughs> just right around. exactly right. He would start looking like a <laughs> Union general in the Civil War if he did that. So uh, so yeah, he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna come straight down. Um, All right. Now, how do we do... The, uh, but, of course, then we get to our other change, which is the fact that it's Sauron's werewolves. And a couple... I know Hakan has already seen it. You see what we've set up here, right? Without even intending to. Notice... Who is it who's going to... Who turns back the southern army? Kelagorm. Kelagorm turns back the army of werewolves. How would he be able to do that? Boom! Right? Huan! Oh my goodness! This is where Huan establishes his reputation as the greatest wolfhound ever. It is this battle that leads to why every wolf in the world is shaking in its boots. It's right after, if they had boots, it's after this that Morgoth is going to begin his, uh, his, like, Karkaroth eugenics plan, right? Because this is the moment when Huan establishes himself in... Middle Earth, right? I mean, like, holy cow, this is like a silver platter, right? Uh, Kelagorm and Huon. So Kelagorm and his mounted troops with Huon at the lead of, uh, of you know, a, 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 a mighty pack of wolfhounds uh, turn back the, the werewolves uh, of Sauron and Draugluin. We can even get a little... Uh, an, an initial conflict between Draugluin and Huon in which Draugluin flees from Huon, so that when Draugluin meets Huon a second time at the bridge, um, you know, with, uh, with, with Luthien, it's payback for Draugluin, right? He's going to, he, he's going to be all like, I, I want another crack at that guy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, uh, this is going to be, see, 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 yeah, good. See, Nick and Marie, I, I knew you guys would be thinking of this too. I mean, this is, it's, like I said, it's right there, right? Right fruit. See, you guys were all getting all worried that I was going to do something weird. It's not something weird. It's something awesome. It's, it's something clear and awesome and absolutely fantastic. Um, so, uh, now, Nick, I agree that this could be happening while the Noldor are chasing the main army back to Angband. Um, so let's think about, so we've got the, th- three moving pieces. Well, four counting the Noldor army, right? But um, let's see. So how should this go? I can see a couple options. We've got the Noldor are static, right? They're in their camp. Gothmog comes down from the north. Gothmog's army is defeated. They're going to run towards Angband, right? They're not going to run back to the north. So they're going to head toward... We, at what point does the other army of orcs come in? Do they come in right at that same... Like, Do we want to have it look like the Noldor, like the bad guy's strategy is working out, right? They're, they're, they're fighting the, the 
battle against the forces that are attacking from the north, and while they're still engaged with them, all of a sudden this other army appears out of the east, and it looks like everything looks really bad for the Noldor, right, until they start to mow down the orcs. But see, here's the other challenge. Here's the other challenge. The other challenge is, how do we convey the supremacy of the Noldor? Right. I mean, remember, the emphasis in the text is that one on one, the orcs are like absolutely no match for the Noldor. I mean, the Noldor, even though they're taking it unawares and they're not prepared and everything, the victory of the Noldor is swift. Right? I mean, they they absolutely destroy them. Um, this is a this is a this is the easiest victory that the elves ever win in these battles. Right. Um So I'm trying to figure out how we spring that exactly. You know, how we, how we, how we manage it. Um, yeah, David, I agree having the, uh, David Atlee suggesting having the arrival of the reinforcing in the second army of orcs should be like an anti u catastrophe. Uh, Gothmog's host is near uh, defeat when they're apparently rescued by timely reinforcement. And it looks like, okay, this must be. Uh, this must be it, right? It's true, Marie. The Dagor Aglareb is pretty easy too, but but still, I mean, it's one of the easiest, clearly. Um, uh, I'm just okay. So two options. One, both they both armies engage them at the camps, right? Gothmog's army first, and then while they're engaged, the second army comes in. David, like you suggest, like an anti you catastrophe, um, and then the Noldor still just beat the both of them on two fronts at the same time. Um, or alternatively, they could defeat Gothmog's army, and then Gothmog's orcs are running to the east and crossing the mountains, and they're pursuing them. The Noldor are pursuing them across the mountains, and so they meet up. Uh, here, like where the red X is. Um, so basically, they're they're chasing them back to Angban, and then the other orc army comes, and then they uh, they they face the other orc army, and then they uh, and then they retreat as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, Chris, you're right. An anti u catastrophe really is just a catastrophe, right? But but it doesn't have quite the same connotation. Um, yeah. Um, disc catastrophe. Yeah, you're right, Lincoln. Logically, I guess that's what it would be. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Le- I mean, I kind of like the, you know, having them attacked from two fronts and it look like it's, you know, they're hosed, but then it turns out that they're, you know, like they just like, they, they win easily anyway, but I'm not sure that that isn't going to be more awkward actually. Um, I, I, I think that, that, that is more awkward. The more I think about it, the better I think it is if they win essentially two battles in short, in quick succession, right? They trounce Gothmog and his army, and then they're in pursuit, meet the other uh, army, which, you know, uh, can be at least as big or maybe even bigger, uh, and then they trounce them too. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, Hakan exactly. While they are pursuing them, so if we had, so the the werewolves are coming up here, right? Um, so that so it's when the Noldor are pursuing the orcs. So the orcs are over here on the eastern side of the mountain, uh, on their way back um, to uh, to to Angband. The Noldor are in pursuit. The Noldor meet the other. Uh, um, the Noldor meet the other army of orcs coming out of Angband, and at that moment the werewolves come up from behind and look like they're going to take them uh, from behind. And that's when Kelegorm then ambushes the werewolves uh, with his mounted cavalry and with uh, Huan and the wolfhounds. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, Marie, that, that works for me. The Noldor decide to pursue Gothmog's retreating army over a mountain range, and when they cross it, new army waiting for them, approaching them over the plain. Yeah, I think that that kind of works. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that that... that do, and it just shows, again, like, they, they can... That, and they just they win again and again and, and they win both of them, each of them easily. And I think that Kelligorm puts the werewolves to rout fairly quickly. I mean, I think that they scatter them and they run away. Um, I think it would be really cool if Draugluin uh, basically is, is, is ashamed of how the werewolves performed. Uh, and so, I mean, he has a personal grudge against Huon and um, and he's uh, um, and he's really um, yeah he, he, he has he has a personal grudge against Tuan and is, is you know feels that he has to uh, you know sort of recover from the poor showing that they that they made um, you know by the fens of Serek. Uh I think that that I think that that works. Uh, okay, good, good. I like this. <clears throat> I like this sequence. But how awesome is the Huan thing, right? I mean, come on. That is going to be so great. I am super excited uh, about uh, uh, the excellent uh, the excellent Huan action there in this episode. Um, the more chances we have to, to show him off, the better. Absolutely. And this is, as I said, this is really where he establishes himself and his Beleriand wide reputation. Right. And this this is why Huan is famous everywhere in Beleriand. And, you know, the story of his deeds has yeah, reached yeah. Doriath and everywhere else because he should just, you know, tear through the werewolves, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nick is suggesting sort of almost prefiguring Bjorn at the Battle of Five Armies. Yeah, the scale won't be like, I mean, he won't be like gigantic, but, um, uh, but, but, but yeah, I mean, to, to have that, to have that kind of effect, um, that'd be cool. All right. Uh, so I was kind of, uh, I was kind of jumping around here. Let me, uh, let me go back to where I, let me go back to, hang on a second. Where am I again? Uh, villain storyline, do we, fin- no, we didn't quite finish that. Let me go back to that. Okay, here we are. Um, right, so at the near the end of the episode, we want Thorin Gwethel bringing to Sauron news that Tevildo has found the elves in Menegroth. So I'm thinking we can juxtapose that, right? Draugluin shows up to Sauron to tell him of the defeat, right? So Draugluin is confessing uh, that Theonor has crushed the... Balrog's armies, like th- almost all of the the orcs of the uh, you know in the northern army, have been destroyed. Handful of leaves, remember. So you know the Feanor and the Noldor have almost annihilated the orcs in the northern army, and uh, uh, and the you know Endragluin will then have to confess that like his werewolf ambush was completely. Uh, uh, destroyed, and so he's going to be all like growly, and 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 Sauron's going to be kind of upset. But that's when Thorin Gwethel shows up to say, Tevildo just reported in, and he's found uh, Minigroth. Right? We know we know where Thingol's uh, where Thingol's keep is. You know where where his stronghold is, and and then Sauron says, you know, let's let, let's like uh, let's cry havoc and let slip the spiders of war, uh, so that we set that up for the next episode. Uh, cool. So we have Sauron again, unlike Gothmog, uh, whose armies have failed him. Right? Sauron is he is the master strategist. Right? He's still in control. Um, he's you know there's a there's they're 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 having problems up north. His his own werewolves were defeated, and yet. Uh, even and the you know bulldog and the orc armies were also turned back and then uh, uh, largely you know uh, uh, largely destroyed by the dwarves coming in from behind. Um, so there's been defeat all over the place, and yet they you know he's struck a you know the the orcs bulldog and the orcs accomplished quite a bit right in the in the in the you know the the large scale destruction and demoralization uh, of the green elves, and Thingol has been lured out into the field so that now. Uh, uh, Sauron can unleash his uh, his master stratagem and uh, enmesh Doriath and take out Menegroth uh, while Thingol is away. So, 
<clears throat> so yeah, I think that this uh, this shows Sauron in, in the kind of light that we want him to be in here. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, what does Gothmog do while the orcs are running away? He's presumably not going to run away. <clears throat> I mean, not like it's you know we're not going to imagine him pelting along in the forefront of the orcs, right? Running back across the mountains. Um, so he has to be sort of withdrawing and going to meet up with the others so that when the other army of orcs, that is, so that when Feanor and the Noldor cross over the mountains, they find Gothmog and so they, they find all three Balrogs, right? Um, yeah. Tactical withdrawal, Marie. He's not running away. It's a tactical withdrawal on his part. Um, <clears throat> but here, see, we have to be careful because we have to make sure not to show him entering the combat at any point, right? Because we're risking undermining our Balrogs of Doom effect that we were talking about earlier by having the very first engagement of the Balrogs with the elves be a, a, a whopping defeat by the Balrogs, right? Of the Balrogs. Um, so we have to make sure to distance, I think even physically distance, Gothmog from the army. I'm like I'm thinking having him standing on a mountain looking down over the valley where the orcs are being slaughtered by the Noldor maybe. Something like that. Yeah, that's what I that's what I'm envisioning as well that he he sends his sends his force of orcs in but doesn't engage himself. Maybe yeah. he, he he's um he wants to he, it, it, it's almost like a uh, just a bit of a sortie. He just wants to kind of see what the, what what the elves have. Um, yes. He gets in yeah. And he's waiting. So yeah, if we actually have him on the mountains, he can be looking down from a distance and watching them and also looking the other way for the other army to come because he sent for reinforcements. Right. Uh, so he's waiting for the reinforcements to come. So he will join in then. So he won't join in the battle until Fanor is captured. So the first time we get Balrogs in combat against elves is going to be the death, for, will be for the death of Feanor, and that, that works. That works. Okay. Yep. All right. I like that. As long as we can keep him distant from it, so that there's no, uh, because I don't even think we want to show Balrogs killing minor characters a lot, right? I mean, when, when a Balrog show, it doesn't just mean that lots of people are going to die. It means that, like, named characters are going to die, right? You know, this is, this is, you know, yeah. characters that you care yeah. about are about to die when a Balrog enters, enters a battle. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think, yeah, I don't think we want to, I don't, I don't think we want any Balrog scenes that are the equivalent to that, to the, to the opening battle of, uh, yes. of the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings right. film where there's Balrogs just striding amongst, um, un, unnamed, faceless CGI characters just kind of swinging you yes, know, their absolutely. With back and forth whacking people. I think we, we as much as possible, every Balrog uh, battle should be like a, a up, up, up close and personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yes. Yes. Not only, I mean, I guess we have to figure out what to do with, we, we may have to think, we may have to revisit some of the, the earlier sort of, um, you know, Valar on Valar battles. Um, from earlier in the first age and are the Balrogs involved there but, but I think that's probably okay right because that's, yeah. not the, that's not the same as putting the Balrogs against an elf yeah it, it's a different story and there we can be foreshadowing the War of Wrath right especially with Aonwe remember we had Aonwe be the one of the primary movers after he was killed and came back again remember with uh, you know the 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 valor of Aonwe. Um we did kill off like half the Balrogs in that battle. Um but um um but that's okay. Again, yeah, I think I think I think it is different with, with the Valar. And I think if Aonwe killed a bunch of them uh in the first battle it helps to you know you know, Dave, even thinking about one of the things that we can help to accomplish, actually, with this is it's one of the challenges, right? Going from season one to season two to season three, we have to communicate the change of scale. I mean, when the Valar yeah. are going toe to toe, we're just not talking about the same thing as when, you know, and that change of scale from the Battle of the Valar to the Wars of the Elves to the Wars of the, you know, the Wars of Men in the Third Age, right? I mean, it's 
the scale keeps getting smaller and smaller. And that's yeah. one that's one of the difficult things for us to, to accomplish, but the Balrogs actually help, right? In 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 the first battle, at the end of season one, they're foot soldiers. They're the grunts yeah. in, in in that battle, in that scale, right? But then when we remove them into the elf scale, now they're huge. And 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 right. and you know, we're able to convey they look the same, but you know, they don't uh, they don't act the same. Um, you know, the, the whole impression of them is not the same because the scale is different now. Um, now, Hakan, I can agree with you that we we may want to make the one exception we might want to make in the not having Balrog striding through the battle slaughtering folks rule might be the Dagor Bragalak to convey yeah. that, you know, the shock of the onset of the, uh, you know, of the wave of fire and the Balrogs. Um, uh, yes, all, the, all these rules go out the window for the uh, Dagor yeah, Bragalak. There can be, but again, that... that Fast cart. Right, that's the whole point, right? That's the whole point of how we make the Dagor Bragalak special, uh, is that it's, it's you know, it's this this shocking and whereas like with the near knight or um you know we have the uh, you know the unleashing of you know well remember we're, we're, we're gonna get more glaurung later on too and that's a, a whole separate kind of unleashing in the same sort of way but anyway um that's great okay so great excellent i think we're i think i think we've got a i think we've got a good plan for this now we do need to hear talk about the sons of feanor and i'm gonna ch- my real challenge here is to not get too distracted by this. Um, some of this I think we can develop further later on, but uh, uh, and some of this we already have. Um, we've already set up Kurofin as the confidant of Feanor, and the one who is the sort of, not only the heir of Feanor in the sense of the, the one who has inherited the greatest share of his maker ability, um, which he's going to pass on to his son, uh, Celebrimbor, but uh, Kurofin is also like the, the crafty strategist, and I think the, the least, I don't know, like the least scrupulous. Kurofin is the schemer, the greatest schemer, I think, of all of the sons of Feanor. Um, and so, therefore, should be the greatest rival of Mithros. Um, Mithros has, you know, as uh, the, uh, as uh, Marie and uh, other folks on the discussion boards pointed out, um, you know, Mithros has set himself up in opposition to Feanor. He publicly, he, he, he um, stood aside, right? He tried to resist him at the burning of the ships, and he stood aside from the burning of the ships. So Mithros has kind of drawn a line between himself and his dad, right? Um, so I agree that there should be some, uh, and I think that Kurofin in particular should see this as both a threat but also as an opportunity, right? Um, he's gonna uh, <clears throat> he's gonna try to um, take advantage of this opportunity. Mothers is the obvious. I mean, he's the oldest son, right? And Mothers is the obvious sort of heir of his father, but Kurofin is like the real heir of his father, right? And he's gonna want to not that they're thinking of succession. They're elves, right? So they're not thinking in terms of. Of, of, of succession in the way that humans would think about succession uh, in the same kind of situation. Um, but certainly he's going to, you know, we <clears throat> will want to be able to think in terms of Kurofin scheming against Mithros, I think. Um, <clears throat> now, I agree with the idea of Maglor being Mithros's confident uh, and right-hand man. So, yeah, so we have Maglor and Mithros together as a unit, um, Karanthir is a loner, but I think he... I mean, and we know that Keligorm and Kurofin work together, too. I'm thinking of kind of Keligorm, Kurofin, and Karanthir as being a little bit more of a unit. I like the idea of Karanthir being being a loner, but he's also a jerk. Um, I, I think that... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, so I think that... Karanthir and Keligorm would be the two that Kurufin would sort of rally to his cause or try to stir up against Mithros, right? So he would uh, so he would try to stir up Keligorm and Karanthir against Mithros. Maglor would stand with Mithros. This leaves Emros uh, mourning the death of his twin brother Emrod. Um, I hmm I'm not sure what to do with Amros. 
it seems to me, I mean, when I ask myself what I think, I mean, just given the position we've put him in, right? The fact that his twin brother is killed in the burning of the ships, how does he respond to that? I mean, I, I got to think that his bond with his twin brother is even stronger than his bond to his dad. I mean, the real burning question in my mind is, does Amras turn against Feanor as a consequence of the burning of the ships and the killing of Amrod? Um, and I don't know... <clears throat> I don't know exactly... If, if he necessarily would. I mean, maybe he really does internalize the fact that Amrod's death was a result of his, Amrod's breaking of the, the oath, right? Amrod broke the oath and he died. Maybe he, you know, in wanting to sort of rationalize and reconcile himself to the death of his brother, he blames him that way, right? You know, he, he, he you know, maybe the psychological position Amros gets himself into is you know, Amrod brought it on himself and that's how he can go on, right? That's how he can continue to follow his dad. Um, uh, he could blame himself, Mariel, yeah? But I'm not sure where that puts him, necessarily. Um, he could, I agree, Hakan, he could become just sort of nihilistic and, and, and apathetic, right? He could just, he could become extremely cynical, Essentially, and kind of distanced from everyone. Um, I guess at the end of the day, um, I guess at the end of the day, my real question is, Fanor is going to insist at the time of his death, he's gonna, like the, his sons are going to renew the oath. Will Amros go along with it? Mightn't Amros just refuse. That oath brought about the death of his brother. He's not having any anymore. Have Amros be the, uh, you know, the, the, the non-compliant rebellious son of Fanor. I mean, what it's a big consequence of that. Well, I don't even know. This is my problem, right? I mean, I, it's not that I want to do that. But I'm just trying to, like, when I, when I start from where we are and just try to move forward, it's where I keep ending up, right? It seems to me most likely that he's going to, like, why would he want to carry on down this path that got his brother killed, right? Um, it's, it's really hard for me to see him just continuing to go along with his dad. I mean, maybe, but I'd, be, I'd, I'd have to be convinced that that makes sense psychologically, um, now, I agree the other alternative is just to have him be, like, in complete denial and become a completely, like, psychopathic devotee of the oath, right? Just to have him be absolutely all in as a way of rationalizing. That's the only other thing that I can see. Have him, like, he has to be either the best in the sense of actually, um, you know, like, conscientiously objecting, to what the rest of the Feanorians are doing more than Mithras. Mithras goes along. Well, he objects, but he goes along, right? Um, to have him go even further than Mithros in in breaking from the family, uh, 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 you know, pact, or have him just be absolutely all in. Um, yeah, Rickle, I agree. I, I, too, find it easy to fathom Amros just being totally done at this point. Um uh, I mean, keep in mind, this is a character who gets almost no... I mean, he never gets a line uh, in the books. He... I mean, he is a really insignificant character in the sense of, like, that. I mean... Just as we have the freedom, I and mean, of course, and it's justified by you know uh, Tolkien's later ideas and the Shibboleth, but um, uh, but you know it's easy to kill off Amrod because he wasn't doing anything anyway, right? There's no there's no goal for him other than just the point at which he's killed off later on, and the same is true of Amros. Um, I don't. Th do, 
What do we need him for? Do we need him for something later on? I mean, is he going to be crucial for anything later on? I, I can't think of anything that... I mean, I think he could be spared from almost everything else that he's meant to be involved with. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I know he's going to get killed. He's scheduled to get killed, according to the normal uh, uh, path of things, at the Havens. Um, but, uh, but, I mean, we don't... We don't do we need that? I don't think we need him for that. Um, we want him to be the one to talk Mithros and Maglor into attacking the Havens? Maybe? I don't know if he's indispensable, though, for that purpose. Yeah, I don't think we need him. I mean, in some ways... I mean, I, 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 I hear that. Um, I hear that. But at the same time, I almost think that the attack on the Havens should come from Mithros. Like, this should be that, that Mithros is in the final stages of just being driven to the, to do the things that he knows are horrible. Like, he is under no, I, I don't want him to get convinced from outside. I want him to, like, attack the Havens knowing that it's horrible and but feeling he has no choice. I mean, that's kind of like the way that the curse comes around to them at the end. Um, <clears throat> now, I mean, I agree, you know, I, Mary, I have no interest in needlessly changing the text. I'm not just going on tangents. I'm just trying to pursue the story that we're, that we're having. I can't reconcile it. I mean, I can't in my mind reconcile the character of Amros just continuing to go along after the death of his brother. It's a big deal. I mean, unless we're just going to be like, ah, you know, it wasn't all that close to his twin after all. It's fine. <clears throat> he's just going to continue on towing the party line. Like, no, he's not. Uh, is he? I mean, again, I can... He was a traitor who betrayed the family. I, yeah, I, back on the oath. To me, that's the only option. To me, that's the, the option is to make him... <clears throat> like he really yeah, blames her. himself and he's really upset with his, uh, you know, with his father, <clears throat> but he sort of internalizes that by, you know, kind of turning on his brother and blaming his brother retroactively. And that's true. He has, to, he has to go, he would have to go even further in the other direction. Right. <clears throat> I mean, that's the only, to me, psychologically, that's the only thing that makes sense. Either he, he becomes, either he breaks from the Fanorians you know, to, 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 to a greater or lesser degree, but um, <clears throat> either he breaks from them uh, and is the most extreme opponent of Feanor and of the Oath among the brothers, or he becomes, like, monstrously, mindlessly pro-Oath as a way to, like, shield himself from self-loathing, essentially. Um... <sighs> I, I, I can't understand it. Uh, I can't understand it any other way. Um, and I kind of feel like in either case, we have to kill him off sooner. One way or the other, he's going to be too hot to handle <laughs> for the whole time of the first age, you know? I don't think he can make it all the way to the Havens uh, without... Cause, because this is like a domino effect, right? <clears throat> By going back and writing the death of Amrod into the story, as Tolkien never fully did, right? And remember what happens when Tolkien does that kind of thing. When Tolkien does that kind of, when he actually goes and writes back changes into the story, it has domino effects on what happens to other characters and what happens in the rest of the story, right? That's all that's happening here. That's what we're doing. Um, we're doing that thing. So are we changing the text? Yeah, but of course Tolkien would have had to change the text had he actually done this. And that's what we're doing is saying... What would it look like if we actually followed through on that thing? Um, so, um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and as I said, Amros is easy enough to kill off earlier because I, I don't think we absolutely have to have him later on and he has no huge role. Mariel, he could commit suicide. That's, of course, another option, right? Um, he could kill himself soon. And yeah, well, Hawkeye is saying he could be passive in traumatic depression until he decides to kill himself in the attack on the Havens. But do we re really want him lingering in tragic, in traumatic depression for like eight seasons? <clears throat> I can't imagine that we'd want to do that, 
I mean, we could just forget about him for a while, but people would have utterly forgotten about him. I mean, I think if we're going to have him depressed and then killing himself, it's, I mean, I, I'm not saying that he, it's not possible. I'm not saying, but I'm saying from a, from a storytelling standpoint, if we want him to be kind of withdrawn in a non-entity in the story until he eventually kills himself, we should do it sooner, shouldn't we? While that, I mean, by then, 10 years down the road, people are going to be like, what, who's that guy? Oh, wait, his brother died, like, years back, right? Oh, okay, right? I mean, again, I get it. Like, he's an elf, but... Um, <clears throat> uh, and I agree, Chris, that we can ignore him as long as we need to. I just don't see why we'd want to. If we're going to... If this is going to be, if, if the centerpiece of his story, of the story of Amros, is going to be the death of his brother and his reaction to the death of his brother, why not deal with it closer to the death of his brother while it still means something to the viewers, right? Um, yeah, if, he, if he's going to, if he's going to disappear off screen, then we should just kill him now. Uh, we shouldn't, I, I agree with you. The, the emotional impact of like, <coughs> disappearing and then reappearing at the end there's no way we're going to be like, oh, that's right. Yeah, he, right. he was really upset that his twin brother died. Oh, well, that's why he's behaving this way. No, that's not going to work. People might recall it, but it'll be a, a, a like an item of trivia, not a not a not not a real emotional impact. Now, I agree. <clears throat> Marie and a couple others were reminding us that uh, we have, um, you know, all of the sons of Fan or either die by their own hands or are killed by other elves. None of them are killed by you know, by, uh, by the villains. And I agree that we would want to maintain that. This still, of course, keeps suicide in the picture. Um, but could we have, could, so if we do have him commit suicide, we could have his suicide be an anticipation of Mithros's casting himself into the, into the pit of fire. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we either have to have... If he's going to die soon, it has to be suicide, doesn't it? What other elf is going to kill him? We're not going to have any elf-on-elf -elf combat in Middle-earth for quite a while. Yeah. Is he going to... Uh, how do we make that dramatic, though, so that we care about it? Like, like, because I don't think we want to do that amidst the battle of the battle under the stars. Because no, it'll go unnoticed. Yeah, and and anyway, we want the battle under stars to be a thumping victory for the Noldor, with the exception of the of the uh, mortal wounding of Feanor. Uh, so we don't want to detract from that. What if we do it at the end of the season? What if he kills himself after Mithros is taken? We could make it part of the sequence of despair among the Noldor at the end of the... So Fëanor has just died, Mithros has been taken. Yeah, that would work. Um, yeah, and Marie was just thinking of that, of that same thing. Um, when it looks like Kurofin is taking charge, Nick, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> or would we want to do the even more deviant thing? That is, have him be a conscientious objector, have him walk away from the Feanorians and not share their fate. I mean, that seems to me a perfectly plausible thing to have him do. But if we do that, we're like, we're really going off into the blue, right? I mean, we have no basis for that in the text. And so I mean, we, we can go there. But that seems to me to open up a much bigger can of worms than just having him commit suicide. David is saying, what would be the effect of the oath if he consciously chose to walk away from it? Well, that's just it, right? We could show him being, uh, uh, being a, a casualty of the oath, essentially. Now, 
see, I'm. People are suggesting distant ends for him. Hawkins was just suggesting after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Um. Again, I. If his storyline is going to be focused on his reaction to the death of his brother, I think it's really important that we keep his end more proximate to the death of his brother. If that's going to be his story, we can... I cannot see dragging that out over years and years and years. And we check in with Amros. Amros is still depressed, right? And conveys through dialogue that he is still depressed, right? Uh, until finally, you know, nine years... nine. Uh, you know, seasons later, he finally he finally dies. Um, uh, I have uh, um, I have a tough time. I have a tough time with that. I just don't think that that's going to work. I think if we want to bring him to a a tragic end, it should be a swift and tragic end. And again, not in the in the in the. Um, the battle under stars because we want that we want Fanor to be the only casualty only major casualty of the battle under stars but we but but again afterwards like to emphasize the um the the bleakness of that moment um when Mithros is taken and it looks like everything is in is in a shambles yeah Because, again, we don't need him. We don't need him later on. What would we do with him later on? Who wants who wants a depressed Amros hanging out for centuries? Seriously. What good does he do? I don't know. I don't know. I want to off him. Um... I take it we're rejecting the he goes the other direction and becomes completely manically, psychotically, uh, you know, like <clears throat> the most dedicated to the oath of any of the sons of Fanor and the swiftest to do insane things. Um, see, I, 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 I'm not comfortable with that. I agree that that seems to me like a, a real psychological possibility, right? Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, to do that would make him more of a mover in the events. Again, this, this this involves shifting a lot of things, right? I mean, he becomes a real force. Um, yeah. Well, Hakan, we're not killing him off in this episode anyway, so we do have some time. We we have uh, we have many weeks to think about it, uh, and we can come back and 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 review. Um, Okay, let me end the Amros discussion by saying this. Several of you uh, who are attending here today, you know, many of our regular posters and script writers, uh, want to keep Amros around, want to keep depressed Amros around for a long time. Convince me. Why? What's the point of him? Tell me what could be accomplished by him. I don't want to hear because he's supposed to be there at the Havens. I don't care. Right? Uh we don't need him at the Havens. <clears throat> it's okay if he's not at the Havens. I like it better for him not to be at the Havens. And anyway, when he was at the Havens, so was his brother, whom we've already killed off, right? So I want to develop his... If, if you can show me a way in which we are developing his story logically, like you know, with, 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 with psychological logic from this moment, in a way that's going to really contribute and make the story interesting, I'm totally game with allowing that to happen. How is he going to be interacting with his brothers? What role is he going to be playing in the rest of the events that happen? If, if you can show me how having a depressed and uncomfortable with the oath Amros around is going to work, great, great. Um, but I'm not convinced of it. And I, all things considered, I would like, I would prefer to kill him off in this season. Um, that seems to me... Because that is, we can make that a really powerful element in this story, the story of this season. We can, we can use Amrod and Amras as the sort of bookends of the story of, you know, this early story of the Feanorians, of the tragedy 
uh, and destructiveness of the path of the Feanorians. And we can show that in two different ways, right? The deaths of Amrod and Amras can be ways to really highlight um, that they, they really show like, okay, you know, the, the Feanorian train is, is on, you know, uh, uh, it, running down the fast track to chaos and destruction, right? And Amrod and Emros both <clears throat> illustrate that and in different ways, right? Um, so I think that we gain, we would gain much by killing him in this season. Um, it, it could really move forward the story and really establish the Feanorians in a direction that we want to establish them. I think that much good could come of that um, in future seasons. Convince me that more good could come of keeping him around and tell me what role that you see him playing that makes sense coming from this, uh, coming from where we have him coming from here. Um, so, so uh, show me. We'll do that next time. Oh, dang it, I forgot again. Dave, we forgot again to talk about the Amrod objection. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I just remembered. Oh, my goodness. Um, I've been hovering in the background. Should we have, like, a special episode just for that? <laughs> <clears throat> we'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. Uh, Boy, we really can't win, can we? We can't win. All right, hang on. All right, so now let's do the Amra. So on the on – the, this is <clears> – <throat> sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice, which is not good. Um, uh, we, we talked about this last time a little bit. Well, we mentioned that it existed, then we forgot to talk about it. Um, Dietelbaum, whose uh, screen name I love, uh, on the discussion boards, was saying that he's, he's worried that killing Amrod in the burning of the ships will diminish the horror of that action, um, that the, the primary shocking horror of the burning of the ships should be the destruction of the ships itself. We don't want the death of Amrod to detract from the tragedy of the destruction of the ships themselves and the choice of... so, And, and I absolutely agree. That's one of the things... And now, I think we have a weapon in our arsenal, our storytelling arsenal, to help to make sure we don't lose the impact of the death of the ships. And that's Kyrdin, right? Kyrdin the shipwright showing up and seeing the ruin of those ships and mourning not for anything else, right? But mourning for the ships themselves. Um, Kyrdon is a way that we have available to us to help to really drive home what an amazingly big deal it is that those ships got burned, right? Um, so that's one little thing that can help us, right, to make sure we don't lose that. But I do agree. We want to make sure that the burning of the ships doesn't look like it's all about Amrod. That's a really important point that Dietlbaum made, and I think it's important for us to for us to to, to uh, recall, his suggestion um, was to delay the awareness that Amrod dies. So as the ships are burning, have the emphasis just be on um, on the ships themselves, and then after the fact, like once the ships have burned, or like it, in the latter part of the burning of the ships, uh, we have the the realization that Amrod was on board and has been killed as well. Um, I'm thinking maybe, you know, like is most of the fleet has already burned out and it's, you know, it's, it's the, it's the latter part of the actual burning when we hear the screams of Amrod, um, echoing in the Lamoth as we discussed. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that that's, oh, that way the death of Amrod merely serves as like emphasis, right? On the tragedy, on the loss, on this, on the, the destructiveness, the self, it becomes a sort of an accent on the, that note that we've already been establishing rather than being the whole central story and the ships just being the setting, right, of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, in Timothy, the issue should be the ships per se. That's the really important thing, that those ships... Those ships are to the Teleri what the Silmarils are to Feanor. And that this is the the fact that Feanor is all bent out of shape about the fact that Melkor stole the Silmarils, right? Oh, and if, if you know, if, if they're destroyed, I will die and all those things, right? You know, his his whole life and being is bound up in these things, the work of his hands that he, you know, the, 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 the work that he can never do again. And yet he 
in, in pursuing that, he has done what Melkor did. He has stolen those the, the, the equivalent works to the Teleri, and now he chooses, not only having stolen them, he now chooses to wantonly destroy them. Um, and that's, uh, that's really something. And so, Timothy, you're right. We do need to establish their value um, <clears throat> really clearly two times, right? First, with the Teleri at the beginning of episode two. Uh, when Feanor comes and says, "Hey, can we borrow some ships? We need to make sure that um, uh, they're, you know, the uh, Olway and the others are making it very obvious to him. Like, dude, you don't get it. Like, this is not can we hitch a ride? This is like, you know, what you are asking us is the equivalent of can we borrow the Silmarils, um, <clears throat> or can we have the Silmarils really? And then second, we can emphasize it with Cirdan when Cirdan mourns and laments for the ships after the fact." Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, exactly, Margaret. Margaret says, uh, the death of Amrod is a way of illustrating the consequences of that act for the Noldor. It's not the terrible act itself. It's like the coda of the terrible act. Um, yeah, Margaret, I would love if we could arrange that, if we could arrange for the death of Amrod to show these are the consequences of this kind of act. Feanor, if you're going to act like this, this is, this is, this is what's going to happen. Right. Um, and remember, we talked about how he, um, uh, Feanor is going to spin it, right? He's going to play it into, uh, uh, he was breaking the oath, right? And this is what happens when you break the oath. Um, so he's going to try to make it a, um, to be a, you know, a sign on the right side, on, on his side of the things, right? A, a sign that he's right, not that he's wrong. Um, but I think, Margaret, we do, yeah, we, we do want to make sure that everybody else with Mithros is kind of taking, and I, again, have to assume Amros is taking it in the other way. Um, okay. All right. Whew, all right. <laughs> almost, almost, almost forgot it again completely. Um, all right. Uh, good, good Amros discu- discussion. I'm looking forward to talking about Amros more. All right. So we talked, we talked about the battle, we've done the battle, we're good with the battle. Okay, aftermath of the first battle, that is down in the south. Um, <clears throat> so let's go back to the Green Elves. So Thingol, remember, uh, we had Maglor with Denethor and Cyros and the Green Elves on I'm on Ereb. Um, Thingol and the Dwarves were both supposed to come in. They're both late to the battle. Thingol a little bit less late. He was engaged, but he finally comes in. It's Thingol sweeping in and kicking butt. And as we were touching on at the very end of last time, this is going to be the only time we're going to see Thingol in battle. Uh, So, uh, you know, we can have him um, uh, acquit himself very admirably as he charges, especially since, remember, he's not going to have any, uh, really any of his... uh, of his henchmen with him, right? All of his named folks are off busy. Kelborn is off with uh, Kierden. Um, Beleg was with Kierden briefly and is now on his way back and is going to be discovering the the fact about the spiders and stuff. Um, uh, we've got um, Mablung with the Green Elves. Uh, Dairon is back with uh, 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 back with Luthien and Melian at Menegroth. So Thingol has nobody with him um, in the. Uh, in the actual battle, so Thingan Thingol therefore is the um, is the primary uh, the primary actor there uh, on the front lines. Um, okay, uh, right, yeah, no, so, so Mabel will be there, but they're but they're separated. I, I mean, like in his uh, in his little battlefront, right? Okay. The dwarves are more delayed, and they don't show. And they so it's the the delay of the dwarves, which primarily almost leads to the to the uh, annihilation of the green elves, right? I mean, they almost get uh, uh, completely wiped out um, if Mablung weren't with them, and if Treebeard hadn't come to help, and if then finally Thingol hadn't broken through and beaten back Bulldog's army. Um, so the question: Why were the dwarves delayed from reaching the battle? I have to admit, my impulse here is not to make there be a big reason. I'm kind of thinking they're just like... Because remember, coordinating is really hard. Coordinating over long distances, right? I mean, it's not like they can text each other. Like, sure, they could conceivably send ravens or birds to communicate with each other. <clears throat> and having the dwarves communicating by ra- you know, by talking ravens is kind of a thing that we can set up. But, um, But I'm kind of... 
I'm kind of tempted just to make it sort of simpler than that. Um, if we make there be a big reason right? Like something happened to the dwarves or there was some kind of betrayal within the dwarves or something with Aeol or something like that. I mean, if we, if we, if we make a big reason, then the situation that we create, um, when they all do get together again and when there's going to be some hard words, right? There's going to be some hard feelings, especially on the part of the folks that were on Amon Arab, right? The green elves are going to be, and Treebeard with them, right? Are going to be highly in, uh, on, you know, they're going to be disposed to unfriendship towards the dwarves, right? And blame them for this. If the dwarves have an excuse, right? If they're like, oh, dude, we are so sorry. We totally would have been here, except we have this really good reason why we were delayed by this horrible thing that happened, right? That puts the whole thing on a different... I, what I would prefer is for them to be in this kind of standoff of, of like mutual mistrust, right? The green elves are mad at the dwarves for not showing up. The dwarves are mad because they think they've done fine, right? Like, no, the timing wasn't exactly right, but that's not their fault, right? Uh, they were told to come. They came. Like, they, you know, like it didn't, like the orcs moved faster than everybody expected. Like it didn't pan out the way they, the way they drew it up. But when do battles ever pan out the way that you draw them up, right? Um, so the dwarves could be d defensive, right? Like we did nothing wrong. You told us to come and we came and here we are and we'll, we destroyed most of them. Like, I get it. Like, I'm, dude, I'm, you know, real sorry that a bunch of you guys got slaughtered. It might, you know, might help, actually, if you had better armor or something, you elvish gits. But anyway, whatever. Like, we showed up and we did our thing. What are you whining about? Right? I mean, like, that kind of, for nobody to be in the wrong, for there not to be any excuses, and the dwarves not feeling they need an excuse, and yet the elves, like, that kind of situation seems to me, um, seems to me to have much better potential for setting up the story that we're going to want to tell, especially between the dwarves and Thingol and Doriath later on. Um, uh, I, so, so this is why I, I don't, I, I'm, I, I would argue against a big, um, a big reason, capital R reason for the dwarves to come. Um, because exactly, Mariel, then, then if the, 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 the elves are continuing to grutch about the fact that the dwarves didn't get there on time, it just makes them sound, you know, like whiners, right? Um, and, uh, and and unreasonable. And I don't want them to sound unreasonable. Um, yeah, David Attlee points out the parallel with the Rohirrim before Pelennor Fields. Yeah, exactly. Right? Remember Denethor? I mean, I'm actually just, uh, I'm rereading The Lord of the Rings right now just for fun. And I just got to that point yesterday, to Denethor's line, now indeed would the coming of the Rohirrim be in the nick of time and they don't come, right? Uh, you know, where are they? Oh, are, they are they never going to come? Oh, man, they're late, right? Here we, you know, I think Hiragun's guilt trip, right, to Theoden, uh, the errand rider, right? You can at least disturb the Easterlings and swarthy men from their feasting in the tower, right? You probably won't get there in time to be any help, but at least, you know, you can, uh, you can trouble them after they've already defeated us and are feasting in our, in, our, in our stronghold, right? And Theoden's response is so cool, right? At least we will do that. <laughs> Shut up, man. We're doing everything we can. Anyway, yeah, so I, that, David, I think that's a really, um, that's a really interesting parallel. Um, it, of course, the ultimate arrival of the dwarves doesn't turn out to be quite as catastrophic as the arrival of the Rohirrim did, but uh, but again, similar similar kind of thing. Um, and David Attlee points out that actually having another Denethor in that scenario is kind of funny. That's true. I was totally not even thinking that when I was just talking about that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, and actually, the orcs, the orcs. Yeah. Ooh 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 ooh. Uh, can we? Oh, come on! Give me this. So, script writers. Make a note. We have to have the Denethor the Green Elf say during the battle to Maglor, now indeed would the coming of the dwarves be in the nick of time. Can we do that? Can we have Denethor the Green Elf get exactly an identical line to Denethor of Minas Tirith? Come on. That's got to happen. That's totally got to happen. I, I, oh, man. Absolutely. Um, also, can we, can we get a shot of, of some dwarves ambushing some orcs who are busy plundering? <laughs> yeah, disturbing the orcs uh, from their... Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, why not? Why not? Okay. Oh, man. Oh, the Denethor line. That just made my... Between that and, and like, the Huon moment, that totally that totally makes my day. <clears throat> okay, so I agree that Aeol should be fighting alongside the dwarves. Um, 
I'm okay with the idea of the, with the proposal that Telcar, the Smith, and Aol have sort of a falling out here. Maria, you have to re- remind me why we want that. Like, why do Telcar and Aol need to fight? I mean, I'm fine with it. I'm just, I don't remember what the goal of that is. Is the goal simply establishing that Aol is kind of bad news and questionable? And that Telcar is, by contrast... Okay, so it's just the desire to hint that the the black swords of Aeol are, are, are freaky and bad news, Mario. Okay, right, right. Okay, and Marie's saying that too. Okay, right. To establish the sort of cursed, semi-cursed nature of the of the black sword. Right. And so, so Telcar assessing the sword. Okay, so just to kind of to, to lay the foundation that... So when Beleg says later on, hey, Unglockhell, can I have that? We Everybody should be like, oh, that could end really badly, right? Okay, all right, fine. That's fine. I like that. Um, uh, good. Yeah, so Beleg returns to Menengroth. Yes, uh, Beleg should be the one. Remember, he's the one that um, uh, that comes up. So he, he's returning to Menengroth. Thingol is in the field. We should have him come and... He's the one who warns Melian, right? So the... Uh, 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 Tevildo and the cats are scouting, right? And we, we can have some really cool Tevildo. We, we can have like a really cool... Tevildo scene. I think Tevildo should be the one, you know, as he is like creeping stealthily, like in the trees and stuff. Like having a really ooh ooh yeah. Okay, I've got it. I've got it. Right, Dave. This is gonna be great. We have a scene with Dairon and Luthien doing their thing. Right, Dairon playing his music and 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 Luthien dancing, and then and 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 having them return to 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 Menegroth and have Tevildo like up a tree creepily spying on Dairon and and Luthien and then following them back so that he he locates Menegroth and then can return with the report to uh, uh, to uh, to Sauron about the location so that Sauron can can aim the spiders at them uh, I kind of like that um but Beleg should warn them, should warn them that the attack has come. Should, Mel, should Beleg <clears throat> warn them that the cats are on the loose? We could have Beleg, you know, shoot a couple of Tevildo's cats and so know that these evil cats are stalking around the forest and therefore just kind of generally put them on their guard. Or we could actually have him find a spider and warn them about the coming of the spiders. But I think may, maybe the cats are better so that he comes back with these tidings that there are these creepy, evil, giant cats in the forest and something is going on and we should be on our guard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, Nick, I know, so we had that encounter between Belling and the cats earlier so that we can we can then bring him back with the, with the account of that here. So remember, at Menegroth, we only have... We only have Melian, Luthien, and Dairon, and now Beleg comes back, right? Um, as far as major Doriath characters are concerned. Okay, cool. It's sort of it's sort of funny, but this this the at least right now the storyline in in Southern Valerian with the with the, the Andor and the um, Thingol's people uh, is is actually much more interesting than the Noldor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, so far, I mean, I think you know when Fung, when Fingolfin arrives, it gets uh, yeah, that's it, true. It, it gets more that more complicated and interesting up there. But yes, yes, okay. <clears throat> and hey, look, we're almost done. Only one more thing to talk about. Oh, yeah, um, we should have. I agree. Who was saying this? Uh, Marielle was saying that Cyro should get a moment where he assumes he's going to be the new leader of the Green Elves, and then the Green Elves decide not to select a new leader. So we have Cyros being unhappy there. I th- we, we can totally do that, I think. Um, okay. Back to... F- Meanwhile, on the Helcaraxa. So, this is our second episode in which the people of Fingolfin and Finarfin that are there are still crossing the Helcaraxa. So we killed Elenwe at the end of the last episode, right? Elenwe dies as the sort of tragic culmination of the first uh, the first Hellcaraxa uh, session, 
right? Um, so what do we have? What do we have going on here now? This is a really interesting idea uh, from uh, from from Marie and the discussion boards about Tillian the hunter, because um, they are right. We need to we need to introduce Tillian. Um, so for those of you who don't remember, Tillian is the guy who's going to be driving the moon, right? We've got the we've got the we've got the sun person, right? Aryan, the sun maiden, um, uh, right? The the former Balrog, right? The 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 unfallen Balrog, um, the uh, you know the the Abdiel character. Um, if you don't, sorry, it's a Paradise Lost reference. If you don't if you don't know it, Abdiel is the uh, the seraph who. Uh, is in Satan's following, but when Satan calls the you know his followers to rebel uh, against God in Paradise Lost, um, Abdiel is the one who speaks out against it and refuses and refuses to go along. Um, and yes, Marie, she uh, 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 Arian still has her wings, right? Absolutely. So Tillian is the guy who drives the moon. So we already have Arian. You know, we she's already been kind of set up. Uh, for this, and actually having a Gothmog episode right before, and then an Aryan episode afterwards is kind of cool, actually. Um, but um, Tillian, we don't, we've never met at all, so, and we don't want him just to be a, you know, a faceless nobody who volunteers, right? Um, this is kind of the eleventh hour to bring in Tillian now, that because we're going to do the Moon and Sun in the next episode. Um, but, um, but yeah, we need that. Chris Graham reminds us that, uh, uh, Tillian has an unrequited love for Aryan. but you know what, Chris, I don't think we need to set that up in advance. I think we can have Tillian really struck by Aryan during the whole sun and moon sequence, right? Like, uh, um, that can kind of, um, that can kind of be initiated at the time when they take up the sun and moon. Um, so we don't have to have a pre-existing relationship necessarily, or we know one sided relationship between Tillian and Aryan. but yeah, we do, we do need to have him not just be a random face in the crowd. Um, so the suggestion was that one of the ideas that has been kicking around for a while, one of the proposals for the hell Caraxa could be the Aurora Borealis that, that the, the Aurora Borealis, you know, we we insert a little old style uh, myth of explanation, right? One of those like, and this is how the Aurora Borealis came to be. Um, why are there lights in the north, in the northern sky? Well, the lights in the northern sky are in, you know, are a reminder of the crossing of the Hell Caraxa, and they were first instituted as an act of mercy on the part of some of the Valar who were looking down upon the crossing of the Hell Caraxa uh, and pitying them. Um, and so the Aurora Borealis was designed to, uh, to, to help them. I kind of like that. I mean, I, I, I quite like that, actually. I like the concept of the myth of explanation. I like the idea of that kind of intervention. You know, the one thing that I think is Im- important, <clears throat> and, uh, and David's actually kind of, it goes along with the, cha- with the shift of scale, that we were talking about before with the Balrogs, right? The, like the shift from season one to season two and three. <laughs> when we were in the scale of season one, when the Valar and the Maiar were the only characters that we had and everything that was happening was happening on their level, it's one thing on that level to kind of make them look foolhardy, even silly at times, Um you know, to really be kind of emphasizing the shortcomings and the foibles of them as characters. But when we move down the next tier, right, and we're doing Elvish stories, the Valar, even if the things that they do are ill-judged, even if they're acting wrongly, they're never going to seem... They're going to seem less personal. They're going to seem less, certainly less silly, you know? Um, we're now kind of at one remove, mostly, from the Valar. Um, and I don't want... 
A question that lots of people are going to be asking, and I don't just mean viewers, I mean lots of people in Middle-earth are going to be asking, is where are the Valar? What are they up to? Why have they forgotten us? Why have they abandoned us? And I think it's important that the answer to that question should be, they haven't completely. You think they have, but they haven't. Um, I think that we want to be really careful. It is possible to do a cynical reading of the Silmarillion in which you view the Valar as extremely petty, right? You could do a reading of the Silmarillion in which the Valar's decision not to come across and attack Morgoth right away is just like them being in a snit, essentially. They're so mad at the Noldor that they're like, we're not going to help you. You're on your own. Right? We're just going to let you suffer for centuries because we're still mad at how you, you know, what you did and how you left. Um, now, I think that's a really shallow reading of the book. I'm not saying that I think that's a good reading of the book at all. I think it's a bad reading, but I think you can make that reading work. You can, if, if you have that reading, you can find support for it. Okay? And I want to make sure that we exclude that as a really viable reading. Again, it's one thing to have people in Middle-earth think that way, right? For them to be making those accusations, for them to be interpreting what they see or don't see in that way. But I want to make sure that we don't show the Valar acting that way. The Valar, um, exactly, David, you said it exactly, you said it really, really well, exactly what I was just about to say. David Atley says, the Valar are being extremely careful not to interfere in the free will of the children. Yes. What is the number one reason why they don't follow the Noldor over and, and help and rescue them right away? Because they are respecting their decision. The, they chose, right? Freely you came, freely you may depart. And they are, they are not big on saying, um, we're going to protect you from any possible uh, bad consequences of your own choices, right? We're going to leave you free to make your own choices, and that means leaving you free to receive the consequences of your choices when you make bad choices. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, um, I think it's really important to... Uh, um, to see that. And yes, as Tony and Nick are bringing up, absolutely they don't want to break Middle-earth. Um, and Middle-earth did get broken the last time at the end of season one. Um, and they don't, want to, they don't want to do that. But again, I don't think, for us to have that be the answer to the question, if the answer to the question of why don't the Valar come over and help is because they don't want to break Middle-earth, that's a, it's true, but it's insufficient, right? Um, because if that's the only reason not to do it, then the response to that answer is, then the Valar must be dumb if they can't think of any other way to intervene or help out that won't break Minnow. I mean, like, it shows a little lack of creativity on their part. Surely there's something they could do that's not going to result in the breaking of, of, uh, of, of Middle-earth. Um, and again, I think, it, I think it comes back to the respect of, the respect of, of, of free will. Now, again... As several of you are pointing out, of course, they are going to break Beleriand eventually, right? And I agree. We This is why the decision that they make in response to Eärendil is such a big deal, right? Because this is a massive policy change on their part. But the policy change is not, okay, let's decide starting now to care about what happens in Middle-earth, right? We've just been totally ignoring it and like, we, you know, not, oh, well, oh Middle-earth, right? Yeah, I forgot about that. Are there people suffering? Oh yeah, there are people suffering there. Maybe we should do something about that. I mean, we don't want the Valar to come across like that. Um, it's going to be a policy change and, and we have lots of time to get to why that happens and why they choose to do what they do. But have the Valar forgotten Middle-earth? Have the Valar completely abandoned the elves and everyone else in Middle-earth? No, they haven't. Um, and I think that we, um, we need to make sure that we don't allow that impression to... Again, there are characters, there are individual people who will feel that way and who will say that. Um, but I don't think that that's, uh, that that's what's really going on. So I like this idea of... of a Valar intervention. They're not changing things. Like they're still they're still letting them suffer, right? They chose this path, literally this path, right? They chose this path. The people of Fingolfin chose this path. They're not gonna they're not gonna remove it, 
right? They're not going to come and pick them up and drop them on the land. They're not going to, um, uh, they're not going to, again, they're not going to remove the consequences of their choices, but they are going to help. When the elves call out to Elbereth, she will hear, right? So I think that Varda, um, Varda, Olmo, and Orame were three suggestions. Orame clearly, because Tilian is one of the, one of the, uh, one of the Maya of, um, of Orame, so he should be involved. Um, Varda, I think, is super important for that reason. I think we should show her hearing the cry of of distress from like that. There should be those among the people of Fingolfin who are crying out to her in their distress, and she hears them. Um, for instance, Gildor in Glorian is there, right? Gildor in Glorian is on the Helcaraxa. Um, so, you know, the elf from whose lips we first hear the song of Elbereth, uh, who hears, you know, the exiles, uh, when they call out to her is one of the people calling out to her here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah. Marielle says, not removing the trials, but giving what is necessary to overcome them. Uh, yes, yes, at times. Um, uh, showing them intervening at times to help to, you know, to, to, to hear the distress again, not to just deliver them from it or to remove it, um, but to, you know, uh, equip them or enable them. Yeah, that seems to me perfectly, perfectly plausible. Tillian is the hunter. Question number one. And we're coming to the end of our time here, so I might want to punt this and come back to this at the beginning of next time. Do... Tyrion is... Uh, Tillian is a hunter. Do we want Tillian... Okay, no. So my question was going to be, do we want to do the sequence... Where, so remember, uh, there's that reference in the Silmarillion to um, the attack on the moon, right? Um, uh, Morgoth is gonna is gonna try to take out the moon. He's gonna send these sort of shadowy spirits after the moon, and Tillian is gonna fight them off. Um, do we want to foreshadow that? Anticipate that? It's, a, do we want to do that at all? I mean, do we want Morgoth attacking the moon and the moon fighting off the attack of Morgoth? Is that a thing we even want to do, or do we cut that? Um, secondly, if we do have it, do we have it anticipated? Or if we don't have it, do we shift that kind of thing to here? Um, my big question is who, what shadow demon things exactly are we talking about? I mean, we've been developing the villains and we don't have any candidates for this role exactly. Um, so we'd have to be like at the last minute being like, oh, and there are these dark aerial spirits who fly around, but apparently they don't fly around anymore because he doesn't have an air force later on. But anyway, I don't know. Like we could do it. Um, I, 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 I makes me feel awkward um, introducing a brand new subspecies of villain here. Um, I don't know. But anyway, so I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to think more about this more than we have time in the next nine minutes to think about this. Um, so, uh, Tillian and others can help to make the Aurora. I think that that would be, and, and with the help of Varda, right? Varda, it, the, 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 the light of the Aurora Borealis should be the light of Varda, uh, right? But, um, but it could be Tillian that, that deploys it. Um, ooh, Tony says, what if the dark spirits that are deployed here are the spirits that are the ones being put inside dragons later on? Ooh. Ooh, gosh. Wow, Tony, that introduces me to a totally different problem, which is... Uh, I guess it could just be a teaser, right? I mean, the wholly different problem is, well, then I'd want to develop them even more, and this is a... This is a really, but that's kind of cool, actually. I like that. All right. Let's think about this more. Um, it so, certainly seems better than one-off ad hoc spirit monster yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, we just need to invent a mob to bring in. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's think this over a little bit more. We'll start next time with this. I know it it it, it means we'll still be going back to this episode a little bit next time, but I think it's worth it. I want to I want to get the and then we can we can so we can figure out what we're doing in the hell Hellcar- we'll finish figuring out what we're doing in the Hellcarax in this episode and then we we can finish the Hellcarax for next time um and uh yeah um yeah um okay yeah, so let's do that. So let's we'll, we'll we'll continue this. We'll kind of fold the discussion of Tilian and what exa- and how ha- how the Aurora gets deployed and if there are other spirits involved and stuff. We'll 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 fold that into finishing the Hellcaraxa next time. Okay, all right. Um, oh, Mario, yeah, Mario points out that we didn't even kill Feanor. Well, that's okay. No, because, um, well, he was only going to be mortally wounded anyway. We established he would be attacked by the three Balrogs and they'd try to take him captive and stuff. We'll, we'll sort that out next time. We have to talk about his death anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that in the context of talking about his death next time. That's fine. There's always time to kill Feanor later, Chris. I agree. Exactly. We weren't going to kill him. We were really just going to mortally wound him, but, um, but it's fine. So we, we established the setting for his mortal wounding. We just need to actually execute that, but we'll... We'll sort that out. Okay. Corey, can we also uh, can we also put a pin to in the topic of kind of the changing scale of the story? Yeah. And, yeah. and set aside some time at some point. It doesn't need to be necessarily right away, but set up, set aside some time at some point to kind of dig into that. And like, yeah. How do we manage that? Yeah. So yeah, it is a transition from the Valar as personal characters. Yeah. You know, kind of human like flaws to being kind of slightly more removed god characters who right. seem to know what's going on or the the change from you know balrogs being kind of like oh there's a bunch of balrogs in, the, in that uh you know in that army there attacking the valar to being like these singular terrifying creatures that you know appear infrequently right and that sort of thing yeah, um, yeah. Good. Maria is pointing out that next time we go back to Valinor for the making of the sun and moon, so that's would be an interesting occasion to come back to that question. Ah, actually, true. yeah. It will be our first visit back to Valinor since the darkening of the trees. Really, um, I mean, we had Tyrion and stuff at the at the beginning, um, but we didn't really get into. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes, um, so, yeah. So maybe we can talk about that next time as well. So good. I'm, I'm become super confident that we're going to get through everything we need to talk about next time. Well, I had some other questions for next time too, but I've already just added a whole bunch of questions for next time. Um, uh, some of the, uh, that comes, um, Dave, the issue that you're raising here, I was kind of getting at the same kind of thing in my quest. My second question, how do we handle the physical component of the making of the sun and moon? Um, yeah, do we want to actually have the fruit and the flower and what is the role of the fruit and the, how are we going to manage that? Right. I mean, the, I mean, in the book of lost tales, the, the, the last flower of Telperion is so huge. It has to be carefully carried by two of the Valar and they drop it. And so, I mean, you know, so, uh, how do we handle that? Um, so it, it's really part of that question of scale. I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at really in asking that question. Um, in this case, it's literal physical scale, right? I mean, if we have a fruit of the tree and it becomes the sun, you know, again, how do we, how do we manage the, like the, the physical images there without it looking silly? Um, but it really is about, it really is about scale, right? And I, I do agree with Marie that the, the making of the sun and moon provides us with a really interesting uh, moment to think about those term those, those issues of scale. Um, Two specific uh, other specific questions I had. So, in addition to the stuff that I already said about the Hell Caraxa, how do we convey Feanor's knowledge of the futility of the Noldor War against Morgoth? Um, in the text, he has that that realization internally, but then his words speak against it. Right? Um, I want to figure out how we can convey that. Elem- that I, I want to make sure we don't lose that element of Feanor. It's like that Feanor knows it's impossible. And it's in the context of that knowledge that he makes his son swear. Right? 
Um, anyway, I, um, uh, I just think it's going to be interesting, you know, uh, again, the sort of the broader issue connected with this question is just about how do we depict in Feanor's last moments, right? As we actually do kill off Feanor, um, how do we manage his psychology at the very end? Um, because I think it's, he is clearly not just like, you know, a raving madman at the end. Uh, and I think we need to, you know, how do we convey, how do we handle his fey mood? How do we handle his final realizations? There's a lot, I think, to think through psychologically kind of delicately there. And I want to make sure we spend time doing that. Um, and then finally, we're going to get the girdle of million. We're going to get the spiders and the girdle of million next time. How do we set that up? Um, we had talked about wanting to give Luthien and Dairon a moment there, right? Um, so how are we going to, how are we, I mean, if we just have the spiders converging on Menegroth and then Melian steps out and sings her song and whoosh, you know, the, the girdle come, you know, uh, uh, is established and, and, you know, light suffuses the forest and, um, we can do that, but we had talked about, again, we had talked about wanting to give Dairon especially, um, but Luthien as well. Uh, a moment there, and of course Beleg is there now too. Um, do we want to show combat with, I mean, should this be a battle that's about to be, that it's valiant but about to be lost until Melian comes out, or do we really, do, do we want to change that plan and really just have the whole thing be um, Sauron's plan seeming to work perfectly and Doriath being strangled in shadows and webs and darkness uh, and Menegroth being closed in upon by Shelob and her siblings uh, until whoosh, Melian does the thing. Um, so, anyway, I, 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 that's uh, one of my questions. Let's think through uh, how we're going to set up this. Think about what we're setting up for next time, Tony, as you say. We need to make sure we are thinking about the spiders to set them up for Baron's interactions with them down the road. All right. Lots of stuff to think about for next time. As I said at the very beginning, I, I, I'm really excited about the momentum of season three. I think we're, we're, we're really, uh, we're really building some pretty cool stories as we go through here. Uh, and uh, each one of these episodes is to me more interesting and exciting than the last. So I'm really, I'm really excited, uh, to continue here down in the home stretch, uh, of season three and to continue to work this out. So Thanks everybody for joining us. I got to run, um, but uh, Dave, glad you could make it. I know Trish had to step out already, um, but uh, it was a fun one as always. It now was. We have a million questions for next time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Fall further and further behind. No, I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I will say everybody, thanks for listening, and Godspeed.